Okay, I am recording and today I'm with uh, Johan Tengra. Johan, how are you today? Hey, Sunny. Pleasure to connect with you, man. I want to first introduce my audience to you. So who are you? What's your story? Yeah. My my full name is Johan Tengra. I started out in, in college when I was struck by some ideas and I was going through some lows in life. And uh, that really motivated me to broaden my horizon in a sense and look, look at the world with new eyes, uh, with more curiosity on fundamental, uh, you know, existential things as well as much more larger uh, questions regarding who's running the world and what's really going on the planet. Those days really helped me to deepen my research into many different fields so that I, used, I typically started with a lot of spiritual and metaphysical subjects but then I landed up for opening the world of conspiracies uh, you know that, and this is like five six years back so specifically in India the, the entire conversation around these conspiracies is, is mainly was seen as some kind of uh, hardcore paranoid schizophrenic mindset that she just you think that a few people who run the world and those kind of tropes but I started out at least in my country in a, in a time where uh, no one gave a shit about any of this stuff to be politically incorrect and uh, I've just been pushing the boundaries since then in terms of deepening my knowledge base in a lot of different areas so I would explain this in, in this way that understanding conspiracies really gave me a uh, a drive to find out solutions to, to the issues that we're facing on a global level. And I found that these issues extended into uh, political manipulation, economic manipulation of our systems, the way the fractional reserve banking system is set up, and the importance of deflationary sound money. And I was opening up to all these concepts and researching them because I wanted to figure a way out as to, okay, if this is all that we are facing in terms of issues, whether that be medical tyranny we're facing today or whether that be the erosion of our rights and civil liberties. What can we do realistically to make the world a better place and to make sure that we're doing our bit to have let people have more freedom in their life in general? So that was my entry into Bitcoin because I Bitcoin was introduced to me as some kind of geek money early on, but uh, the more I understood it and I understood the, the properties and the the cypherpunks who were behind uh, building Bitcoin, people like Adam Back and uh, you know others who had uh, kind of anti-state tendencies, who saw the government and authorities as a threat to liberties, which is why Bitcoin was even created in the first place, is to disintermediate the, the third parties and to give us more financial sovereignty in our own hands. So that was my entry into this whole space, but my my vision was always broader than Bitcoin. Like I always saw that since I got into it very early, I got into it when the price was like $800 or something. So I've been involved since since a long time. And uh, we've, I mean, even in the Bitcoin community in India, we've, we've had Bitcoin meetups in, in the past. And uh, I'm connected to a lot of people who are working on the Bitcoin space out here specifically. From that perspective, it would always come off as a little bit off to a lot of the Bitcoin community out here also. Because I, I mean, like my 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 lens of pursuing Bitcoin was not really get into this and you double your money or you make five times or something. It was more about, look, we can use Bitcoin to reduce state power. We can use it to reduce our tax expenditure, which is funding all these bad things. That's the lens that uh, I was coming from. It's more of an agorist or a libertarian perspective that with which I approach the entire subject of Bitcoin. Of course, it helps you get rich, which overall does uh, increase in, like increase your uh, productivity as well as capital that you have so you can do better things in the world but it's also a very political thing to me in, in terms of fighting the issues that, that we're seeing today and it's something that can help lift a lot of people out of poverty as well specifically that's very helpful for a lot of indian people so yeah that's a little bit of my introduction man we got, there's a lot to talk about in in this podcast but yeah this is where I came into the entire Bitcoin subject from and my work extends from in, into many different fields. It's not just finance. I've done a lot of work on my channel just going into the entire way the banking system is rigged to collect taxes in a very hidden way through inflation and to really uh, ma make us not have sovereignty over our own money. I've, I've gone into subjects like really far out subjects, what might come across as far out to people, but it's not actually far out. Uh, currently, I'm focusing a lot on the medical tyranny side of things. So I've done a lot of work in that. But uh, even with Bitcoin, 
when we had our meetup, we'd gone doing street interviews, asking people their views on Bitcoin and stuff. So I've done a lot of work on my channel in different areas, and I've been doing this very actively on YouTube since the last two years. Before that, like the four, last the four years before that, that I was awake to a lot of these issues. I would mainly like just speak and spread awareness in my friend circle and Facebook and things like that. But since the last two years, I've made it very organized and. Uh, I've made an effort to educate people as well as to, uh, you know, organize people once, once people understand the ideas and the, the need to act. It's one thing to just have knowledge about all of these issues, but uh, that knowledge is honestly uh, a waste. If, if, if we don't uh, try to make it practical in our lives and move towards the right direction after understanding what these issues are. So I've done a lot of work on that front, uniting people, getting people together. We've held a lot of protests in India against a lot of the medical fascism that's taking place right now, the lockdowns, the, the mandates uh, with the vaccines and the testing and like, just all of this, like the mask mandates, the denial of natural immunity. Like we've done a lot of work on that front, even not just uniting people, but also uniting doctors and people from the medical community, virologists, immunologists, uh, pathologists, like a lot of people in, who hold specialties in these different areas who are trying to speak out against uh, the scientific fraud that's taking place right now. Uh, me and since the last year, we've organized into a group as well. Like I have a separate project that's called uh, Anarchy for Freedom, where I mainly focus on educating people towards uh, libertarianism, uh, anarchy, like this understanding the misconceptions and then why it's the most moral way to go forward with things and uh, exposing conspiracies. So whether that be geopolitical machinations or the manipulation of a health system, uh, I, I, I'm also a functional medicine practitioner actually. So I like, I actually work at a company where we specialize in uh, root cause medicine. Like we have an expertise in diagnostics and then we basically use that knowledge to naturally reverse someone's chronic health issues. So we deal with a lot of patients who come with us with autoimmunity, with obesity, thyroid issues, and things like that. So I'm actually involved on a lot of different fronts and a lot of different communities. But yeah, Bitcoin has always been something that's been very close to my heart. Yeah, That, that is fascinating. Hey, I was going to ask you one thing. One thing you just said near the end there really resonated, uh, which is speaking about anarchy from the perspective of morality. Uh, that that that's just something that I think doesn't ever happen. And I think it probably doesn't happen because Hollywood and whoever it is have done a good job of messing up the word anarchy and what it actually means. But also I think people don't even consider morality in most of their day-to-day -day lives. But I'm just curious, can you dig into that a little bit for me? I'm curious to hear your perspective. Yeah, a lot of people just see morality as, uh, they understand it interpersonally. If I asked you that, Sonny, do you think you have the right to steal or the right to murder someone or the right to rape? Even if I think even if I asked a murderer, he would know that this is not right for him to do that. Mm. They just have their reasons, mostly because they've been subjected to pain or some kind of trauma in their own life. So they try to pass it on to other people. But no, no one, even like people who actually commit these acts don't think that it's right. They, they just uh, so lonely, sad, depressed people who do it for, from their own trauma. So we are, most of the people, like 99% of the planet or more, probably understands that it's wrong for us to initiate force against other humans because they are sovereign beings. Like they own their body. If, if you leave them alone, they leave you alone. If you encroach on their body or property, they have the right to respond back because that's something that you don't own. Like you just own your body and whatever you have amassed, managed to amass in the world by mixing your body with uh, things that weren't owned by anyone else. So that this is the subject of morality as, as well as rights like it's a deep understanding of rights that that really helps people to understand why the state is an immoral institution because it's not really based on consent and it's, it's based on giving people like giving politicians or legislators more rights than uh, actually exist with anyone else so i mean that the acts that we see as uh, wrong and immoral if sunny you came and stole money from me to, to give it to some poor charity or something even if you want to do it for a good cause I would see you as bad for doing that because you didn't take my consent before taking my own money. So how do we vote in a bunch of legislators who, who can then do the same thing in the name of public welfare or uh, stealing from the rich to give to the poor and, and all these kind of concepts? They don't, they can't exist morally. Like this, the state is a morally bankrupt institution because its very foundation is based on theft. Okay, people try to come up with all kinds of justifications for why taxation isn't theft. Like they'll come and tell you, look, if taxation is not theft because you're giving you're being given something in return. Like robbers don't uh, steal your money and then give you a road in return, but the state does do that. So it's, it's these kind of silly arguments. Like if I ordered uh, pizza at your doorstep and then the 
like uh, do people think that the guy has the right to forcefully take money from you because i i ordered something on your behalf so if you just uh, if people just think these things through logically it, it becomes obvious like even if i even if money is stolen from me and i'm given something in return that doesn't not make it theft like if tomorrow a thief comes and steals something from me and and gives me some bouquet or some some kind of thing in return i i'm not going to magically convince myself that that wasn't theft or something so i th- think that the the fundamental foundational principles of this would be the non aggression principle and the self defense principle uh, that really uh, are at at the kind of central moral factors be behind structuring at least a, an anarchist world view in my opinion so the non aggression principle basically states that you don't have the right to initiate force against uh, another person and that stems from the right to self ownership that basically means that you own your body and whatever happens inside this space is your domain no no one can force a jab up your arm or no one can tell you that you can't smoke a joint or you know put something in your body because it's yours no one else has the authority to tell you anything other than that. that's your ultimate right like the right to bodily autonomy and self ownership is ultimate and from that come our property rights from that comes our right to private property to own a house to to have firearms or whatever that is and sadly these many of these rights aren't present even the right to something as fundamental as the right to bodily autonomy itself has been eroded by the state uh, primarily because the issue with with government is that they see these rights as something that need to be balanced with the collective good or it's something that can be sacrificed if there if some emergency can be invoked or some kind of situation can come up then you don't own your body like then the government can tell you what to do which is a totally immoral thinking as as well as behavior like your rights are absolute no one has the right to tell you like that you can't you have to put something in your body if i can magically tell you that there's some medical emergency that came up tomorrow then i have the right to forcefully jab you this is exactly what governments are doing today and it's because the populations don't uphold their right to self ownership fully like even in today's context like if if we actually upheld that right to self ownership uh, firstly the state wouldn't exist okay because from self ownership come property rights as i said so if i'm working for someone and i'm collecting some wealth uh, which is created by me like i actually put some input in the world and created that wealth then no one has the right to take that away from me whether that's a bunch of people like a gang or even if some people get together and vote for some legislators and then they come and take my money without my consent i don't consent to that process consent is critical for taking away any kind of property from someone like they they have to consent like the sex is not rape because of consent if it wasn't for consent then like even voluntary sex would be rape the only difference between that is if a woman chooses to get it the, the guy voluntarily or it's, it's done with force and is the same thing with uh, tax expenditure as well these people are basically hijacked by, by the forces that that we'll probably touch on in the interview the, the politicians and then they have the right to steal our money and then they get to use it to fund things that none of us agree with so like how is in that theft like, if there's some place that my money is being spent after being taken from me that i don't agree with then it it is theft and most people would have an objection to it but i think a lot of the issue around this with the morality is, is very muddied it, they muddied the waters a lot so because they make people feel like it's an obligation like you live in a society so you can't just be one man on an island and we can't have each man for himself anarchy is conflated with chaos with destruction with no rules okay so that's a total again it's a misnomer because anarchy is absolutely it can only be achieved when people morally understand these concepts once once people understand that you have a right to self ownership and you have the right to private property then you can start with respecting and like giving other people that right as well once once you value it and if we start acknowledging these rights and the government wouldn't exist because the government uh, wouldn't have any monopoly on anything like anarchy and uh, these principles are absolutely against any kind of monopoly like ev- it's basically like uh, it's a private free market totally based on capitalism uh, if you just get rid of the state and the authority which is what anarchy is like forced authority then uh, you can have any number of economic systems that could coexist so some people argue that okay you can have a uh, an anarcho capitalist society alongside an anarcho communist society although although people who study economics would know that uh, like communism or anarcho communism wouldn't really work but they would have the right to exist in their own commune or like uh, work in whatever arrangement they want as long as everything's voluntary like that's what it comes down to okay like we don't want the state stealing our money to fund uh, 
the like poor quality roads or whatever we don't want a monopoly on any institution whether that be the police the judiciary the law road the roads market the trains uh, all of this stuff should not be uh, the monopoly of any entity and no money should be collected forcefully to fund these institutions like just like we don't worry about if tomorrow we wake up and uh, because this, the clothing market is not monopolized by the government we don't worry that uh, there won't be any clothes left for people to consume like there are there's an incentive for capitalists and entrepreneurs to come and provide that service because it's a demand people will want it and there's a profit incentive to take from that so similarly if tomorrow the government just gets out of the road market it's not like you're not going to have any roads like capitalists are going to step up and you know pr- provide you the roads because you there's a monetary incentive to take from that and that comes with competition so that doesn't come with this monopoly on force that the state has through which they can actually you know t- forcefully take our money and then they they can in, in unleash these cops on you that are basically taking away your rights if i can just give an example in a private property respecting an artist society you wouldn't have a police force that would continuously be funded even if they like taking away people's rights or wrongfully imprisoning someone or something like that like there would be a competitive environment in the defense market as well which is what the police is right like we fund the police because we want to be protected from bad people in our own country and we fund the military because we want to be protected from bad people outside the borders of our country so it's a service it's just, it's just like food or it's clothing or whatever it's, as long as it's a service and it's a human need there are going to be uh, people who want to fill it for you and the, if if you have competition it's going to work, work much better because when you have a competitive police environment no one police institution or private defense provider can come in and uh, take away your rights in any way if he did that then people would have the power to defund them immediately like you wouldn't have to be forced to pay for that police force and contrast that to right now most of our issues are taking place because of order followers and law enforcement because they think that they have this moral obligation to obey the law and the law is conflated with the commands and dictates of these uh, bureaucrats and criminals who make it to parliament and then they can they just think that they okay since it's law now i have to do it and if i don't do it then i'm a bad person this is what people have been taught since childhood since the education system that following orders is a virtue and this is exactly what resulted in the genocide that took place in nazi germany or in soviet union or whatever most of the bad things that have been done in the world have been done in the name of following orders and following rules and like mindlessly order followers just submitting their morality and their own sense of conscience to uh, the legislators in the kind of you know imaginary conviction that these people have some authority to tell us what to do when if we just trace it back to the basics government doesn't have the right to exist because as i said we, we cannot give anyone rights we don't have so whatever rights the politician should have come from the people who've given it to them so if we can't steal then we can't just uh, magically give the government that and they can do it in the name of taxation if it's wrong for us to kidnap someone we can't give someone uh, the government that right and then they can come and kidnap someone for any of these victimless crime laws that that they've passed so yeah there's a lot to talk about there but anarchy is fundamentally rooted in morality it's not if tomorrow the state disappears there's going to be violence or chaos or these things are put in do you the have mind. courts do you have courts in a world that is that where there's no governments you still have the court yeah, system yeah you would you would you would so you, you would. still have the ability to that. like how do you handle that cuz like you're right like if you have to boil it down the fundamental thing that people come down to is defense right defense of our country right as a collective like that's one thing you can make make sense of and then again in this world how would that be funded there would just be a bunch of private entities that were like we are the best at protecting the protecting the border because we've got the fancy technology and the free market would just would rise and somehow solved it like you said uh, yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of there's a lot of intellectual firepower and work that's been put into this area if you if you conflate it to the the founders of the you know american country the the people the founding fathers who actually uh, drafted the constitution at that time they saw government as a necessary evil so even though they recognized government as evil and a monopolistic entity that's going to have authority over people's lives and have some kind of monopolistic privilege to uh, steal money from people and then uh, to in order to make it exist they still saw it as necessary because they couldn't conceptualize how the courts would function or how the military would function or how the, ju- the justice system would function but thankfully the the austrians did show up the austrian school of economics did show up and uh, a lot of uh, books have been written on the subject with respect to i can name a, certain, a couple of authors who i really respect 
Walter Block, Robert Murphy, Ludwig von Mises, Marie Rothbard, Hans Hermann Hoppe. There are many authors from the Austrian school who've done a tremendous amount of work, uh, really documenting in detail as to how all of these things could function like infinitely better without the state, as as well as be much more moral. And the, the thing about the discomfort that people need to understand, if I'm saying uh, we need to bring anarchy into existence, it it's not something that can be done by a dictator. like tomorrow narendra modi or trump or biden can't come and announce that okay from from tomorrow we'll be in an anarchist society because uh, people still continue to believe in authority and they want that nanny state taking control of them if even if tomorrow biden comes and dissolves the entire american government i don't think he has the power to do that but even if he does that people are so retarded that they will themselves create another government and the same thing will continue so in order for us to bring this uh, a framework of existence which is in line with to morality and respects everyone's natural rights it needs to be a revolution in terms of first al- aligning the thought process in line with the morality that i described and then we can bring the kind of world about so it is well, the questions people usually ask about the roads and about the the courts i can give you some descriptions of how they would work but i would typically point people to much more detailed seminars where they go through all the common misconceptions like typically when it comes to roads people think that okay if if i want to build a road and everyone agrees but that this one idiot who doesn't agree then what will we do it's it's common questions like that the people think that okay <laughs> if i'm stolen from tomorrow and uh, the, my thief wants to go to his brother's court if it's a private okay, free market kind of thing and i want to go to my court so how would that work of course his court is going to rule in his favor and my court is going to rule in my favor and then there's going to be like this conflict because two courts have given opposite rulings and since there's no monopoly on the law then both of them have the same kind of uh, you know right uh, to to get deliver justice or whatever so these act- these are actually very easy issues because they have been dealt with a long time ago like they're, they're much more complex problems than this that that have also you know so- solutions have been proposed to them but i think it's there are two lines of argument like one is a deontological line of reasoning which is based on principles okay if if you ask me that yohan without the government the if your argument is the courts wouldn't be able to function effectively then as a, a deontologist i would not argue with you that okay look these are the reasons why it would function better i would tell you that it's wrong for anyone to steal money so it's wrong for the state to steal money to fund this monopolistic institution and use the uh, force of violence to stop anyone who would create these institutions the, the first crime being committed is that people are being uh, stolen from involuntarily if a government had to create a uh, justice system monopolize justice system and they came and forcefully took uh, tax money from me at the threat of a gun then that theft okay that's the first crime and the second crime is if i wanted to go ahead and set up my own court to provide the service of justice better than their court did okay and then some law enforcement uh, hired thugs from the state came and shut my court down or threatened uh, you know action against me then that's a second crime okay so uh, these issues with respect to the justice system uh, they've been dealt with very uh, uh, articulated works uh, especially i would recommend uh, a book on uh, the justice system since you're asking me and a lot of the authors that i suggested uh, you know have authored books on multiple of these subjects you can go check out the mises institute's youtube channel where they've done a lot of work on uh, like there's specifically two videos by robert murphy one is called economics of a stateless society and another is the, the market for military defense so that uh, really goes into how the the defense military would function and i think another problem for people to understand is to compare apples to apples like when people compare a, a state run justice system or a state run military or a state run police with an anarchist pol- like you know police force a lot of the issues they bring up for the anarchist uh, police force or the judiciary also exist within the current status system as well so they they tend to ignore that if someone comes and says uh, oh look if we had private defense then these warlords would just keep fighting among each other uh, you can just imagine the countries as different kind of private defense providers and they constantly going to war with each other so the state didn't solve that problem if the state could solve that problem we wouldn't have wars or we, we wouldn't have these countries fighting with each other and you can think of the same thing at a smaller root as well if you think of a country and different states 
you can t- totally even within the status system you have uh, different courts that give different judgments contradictory judgments and then they have a way of reconciling that so even in a kind of uh, you know capitalist judicial system you would have more like courts which had reputation that would go into arrangements to figure out these issues if a court had to, if two courts gave different rulings it's very expensive to go to conflict for that no, no court is going to actually go to war because uh, they want to enforce their order and some other court has given a contradictory order like likely they would come up with mechanisms through the price system that would make sure the justice is happening where the market uh, wants it more whether the force of money is more yeah there's a lot to speak about over yeah, there, yeah, but yeah. a lot of people the, the, yeah. this money. stuff is fascinating and you did say just before we move on to the next topic you said anarchy uh, a lot of people think it means no rules but i think it actually means no rulers right yes yes yeah. that's and, true anarchy doesn't mean no rules like you would have much more stricter rules in a, in an austro libertarian society because you you would actually have private property owners that would really set uh, good rules whether that be like if you are private road owners then there would actually be competition among the road market to make sure whoever has the best rules to have the least accidents so you would not have this one monopolistic institution that would have one rule set okay you would have different people innovating and coming up with the different and even like when it comes to private property as long as private property exists rules will exist if it's a private stadium or just t- take the example of your own house like your house is your own private property so you, you can make any number of rules you want for your house like who comes in can they come in with footwear or not like something as basic as that is something that you can decide because it's your house so similarly when it comes to you know pr- private property whether that be schools or universities or privately owned gardens or whatever all the rule sets would be des- decided by the people who own them so it's not like you wouldn't have any rules in fact i would argue that you would have stricter rules in a, an anarchist society there actually but all the rules have to be based in line with the non aggression principle because that's where all law should stem from like libertarians basically have the conviction that just law is only the law which is in line with the non aggression principle that values uh, self ownership and property rights because all laws that go against that and there are many laws that go against that we have a problem with all kinds of drug laws these money laundering laws against prostitution laws against speech laws against money these kind of laws are just dictates by politicians wherein they are criminalizing an act that hasn't directly caused physical harm to someone else and we are against laws like that even laws like these i don't know if it's exists in the west or not but in india we have like fines if you don't wear a helmet or a seat belt like that's the most basic violation of the self ownership principle right if it's my body and uh, i should be taking all the decisions for what happens with it mm-hmm. i should get to destroy my life or i should get to take it to the pinnacle of success if i want to if i want to destroy my life doing drugs some kind of drugs like heroin or coke because it gives me some kind of pleasure then uh, the state shouldn't have an authority to stop that and there are a lot of uh, knee jerk reactions that come up when you talk about these kind of issues that okay drugs are illegal because my probability of causing harm to someone goes up if i consume something but you can't use that odds kind of reasoning like all these common knee jerk reactions uh, have detailed refutations which are based on logic and principle that i can come, give to any of these uh, typical knee jerk reaction that i'm sure would be going on in the audience's mind also when i'm speaking to a lot of these issues no it's it's, it's a the, minefield it's, it's a minefield man uh, there's so many of yeah. these questions but i think you touched on the most important thing which is it's simply immoral like I, I love, the example i like to think about is slavery right imagine you were complaining about that right oh, who's going to pick the cotton in the fields right how how are we going to make this happen it doesn't matter it's immoral little do you know that the free market would come up with these autonomous robotic mechanisms that could end up feeding all of human the free market works in mysterious ways so you got to trust but it's just immoral i think people can understand that right like at a very basic yeah, level yeah exactly if you if people argue to me uh, how would the roads function or how how would the courts function or whatever the, there are already people who have given detailed answers and refuted them on utilitarian grounds like utilitarianism is basically a cost benefit or like me justifying why a stateless society would be better than a stateless society okay but when we argue in terms of principle like you said You, it's not uh, based on these kind of reasoning okay my my police will function better than yours and we'll have less crime and there'll be less money stolen you don't have to go into any of these arguments like 
it's simply wrong to steal someone's money to have a monopolistic institution that's it you know <laughs> like that's and, that's and where the see, argument starts do you end. see this happening anywhere johan in the world are there any experience you hear about the seasteading institute you hear about people wanting to go to mars and trying to create bastions of freedom maybe islands or something but have you heard of any because that's another thing you get is like, show me an example now the example is bitcoin <laughs> <laughs> right isn't it that an example of it's like uh, money and street, man. right that, the, what, at the is. heart of the state is what the ability the money printing machine and taxation bitcoin kind of sidesteps all of that in a non-violent way that's why i'm i'm, I'm dedicated my life to this for 10 years because i think bitcoin is the embodiment of all of my it just takes all of my complaints about life in the world and it just says here's a ejection seat here's a parachute here's a way out from all of this to some extent and then we're going to get to like the issues that we're facing today in the world which oh my god <sighs> yeah, I, I really i, I yeah, really yeah. want to speak to in the end of the audience also to the bitcoin community because uh, i have a lot of thoughts and a lot of thinking that i've done with understanding the mindset of at least the indian bitcoin community and the typical bitcoin mindset of this whole get rich quick thing and why what's taking place in the world right now is not really going to make that possible if that continues so i mean we we speak to that once once we end this podcast yeah 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 okay so where do you want to go next sorry i spent a lot of time on that but i think that's important because where we're going right if you don't have this basic understanding of 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 like the whole system being overtaken by immorality then it's then it, then it starts to make more sense why it's playing out the way it's playing No, I, I, think, I think it's fundamental even to the issue that we're yes. going to speak about understanding self ownership and property rights is absolutely key to that okay because I, if you remember the thing i said earlier and this is something i'm gleaned on uh, by being involved in the legal system also like even though i'm an anarchist it's, it's not like i don't believe in uh, voting or i don't believe in going to the courts that are currently set up i would give that example like a lot of anarchists think that we shouldn't be voting or participating in the political process or moving the courts because these courts shouldn't exist and we should have a like competitive legal environment and all that so i would i can reckon this to an example wherein like a, a gang of thugs has come and captured your area he the gang has set up their brother to to do the legal to the you know to deliver justice in case any disputes come up and the gang also gives you an option every year to choose between if you want to be stolen by 20% or 30% or any of the other policies they make they give you an option to choose between that uh giving vote like voting for uh, any of these lesser options let's say this gang gives me an option okay we, we have an alternative where uh, we'll steal 20% of your money or we'll see 30% uh, if i go and choose 20% it, it doesn't mean i'm consenting to be stolen from okay that's a totally uh, flawed line of reasoning i just want the least damage done to me and if my captor is providing me with that opportunity to reduce Uh, whatever erosion of my rights and my money is taking that is taking place under him i would of course choose that but ideally the the ideal scenario is like you, you the gang shouldn't exist at all and uh, there should be uh, ultimate liberty i've been involved in the legal process out here and uh, i've been involved in certain court cases as well i've gone and attended cases in court relating to these issues that we'll speak about and i think this entire uh, tyr- tyrannical regime has been put into place because the government is based on the idea that okay we will value your individual rights but if we can come up with some situation that is a kind of emergency whether that's a war or whether that's a epidemic or a pandemic or some kind of medical emergency then we get to restrict these rights then you don't have these rights as much as you would have them without these uh, circumstances and also even in general without uh, any kind of emergency or without any kind of war existing these individual rights aren't seen as absolute they are always balanced with uh, the like these vague notions of collective good and uh, okay it's for the benefit of all and if some have to suffer in that it's fine and this is the kind of argument they use so even when my lawyer made his opening pitch for the right to like self ownership or the fundamental right that i enshrined in our own constitution as well like a lot of the rights i spoke about with respect to self ownership and property rights they're all enshrined in the constitutions of almost every single government around the world but if the constitution just magically gave us these rights why don't we have them okay and we don't have them for this reason because these rights are seen as something to be balanced with uh, the so- collectives of so the societies but this is what the the libertarians have done so much work into debunking is that society doesn't have rights like 
all rights are individual rights okay society or a collective or people this this vague notion of people is just something we use to describe a group of individuals there's no such creature as a, a society or a collective it's it's a term we use to describe individual entities and only these individual entities have rights like you a uh, collective entity can't have rights okay a right can only be extended to some entity that has the full authority to to actually conduct themselves with conscience okay you you can't have uh, 100 people and describe them as one single entity which has some kind of rights because all these 100 people have uh, uh, a different consciousness have different ways in which they ex- want to exercise their body and the property and also they they can't have this one single domain of rights and rights are only individual which is something that the austrian school has done a lot of work on and this is the biggest issue i see in today's society is not understanding that these rights are absolute and if these rights are absolute and we valued that you know we would remove these drug laws we would remove these laws that basically penalize us if you're not wearing a helmet or a seat belt and funnily enough if you see the indian context of this in the aadhar case okay aadhar is this uh, 12 digit biometric id that the government gave to almost everyone in the country a couple of years back this is also started uh, on at the behest of bill gates and his buddy nandan nilekani if you do the research into that but you know what the government came and argued and caught okay there there were some petitioners who were basically contesting that uh, you can't take our fingerprints away and iris scans away because this is our body so we own it and we we don't want to give it to you but the government came and said look the right to body autonomy is not absolute okay if it was absolute they, they literally said this in court if the right to bodily autonomy was absolute you would not have drug laws you would not have laws against suicide okay and this they were using that as a basis to show that there are circumstances in which the state can like erode and overturn your right to bodily autonomy and this is why we we have the tyranny we are facing today because they have this invoked a vague medical emergency like this these acts okay in india we have the epidemic diseases act wherein they say that, okay if a, if a pandemic or some kind of uh, you know virus or bacterial outbreak happens then we have this disaster management authority that is going to it can tell you if you can travel or not and they even have they think they have some provisions to force vaccines up our arms but actually from a legal standpoint they don't have that but my point is that since we become okay with balancing these individual rights with the collective that is why all these onslaughts have taken place that is why lockdowns could take place okay lockdowns could not take place in a world that valued individual and property rights as absolute because then these would be individual risk to benefit decisions okay if i'm concerned about a virus outbreak okay a libertarian society would deal with that by giving everyone the information like people who just uh, work to advance the science in that area and then if, if i'm scared like if the virus has a 1% death rate but if i'm sure that my, my host factors are fine like i have a good vitamin d status or i have a good level of selenium in my body or i have a good amount of omega 3 floating in my blood stream there are so many factors that can make you resilient against these uh, infectious agents okay and make you not succumb to them even if you contract the agent and if i was sure about that and i wanted to open my business okay and whoever was okay with the risk of coming into contact with me and passing this thing around if if that was a voluntary interaction then the state wouldn't have any authority to shut us down okay they, it's just outside their purview so see the state shouldn't exist even if the state existed in a minarchist society just to run the courts and the army and the you know police system and all they wouldn't have the right to shut anything down because this is an there's no force being initiated like the only time that defense is justified or using force is justified when someone's bodily autonomy or property rights are being eroded and they only get eroded in rape murder trespass coercion breach of contract or ra- or murder yeah i didn't mention that or theft of course so these are like the seven eight transgressions we basically have of these rights and anything that is not a transgression is everyone's birth like i don't need any permission from anyone to do anything that is not where i'm not engaging in any of these actions okay i don't need anyone's permission i don't need a license i don't need any kind of regulatory approval or anything like that to be able to engage in these behaviors because I, by the act of me engaging in these behaviors i'm not initiating force against another person so you don't have no one has a right to stop me okay the government is just a group of people so if I, I, i'm leaving everyone alone and i'm just doing something then these group of people who magically think they have the authority because some people voted for them they they can't tell me what to do okay the only time someone else whether that be a person or a gov- group of people called government can tell me what i'm supposed to do or restrict me in any way by using physical force is when i'm engaging in any of these actions that i spoke about yeah so i think that 
going into this health discussion also the anarchist conversation we had around rights and individual liberties is it's at the crux of it that's the ultimate solution i see to all these issues okay if i'm just yeah. going to spend my time and fight the vaccine battle okay it's not going to be a fundamental fix the fundamental fix comes into all these areas when we just acknowledge these principles and like work upon them that's where we can change all of these problems we're facing now. have you ever heard of a guy named stefan molinu of course i have yeah free domain radio i watch him a lot he's actually. banned off the face of the planet now i think it's you got to go to some dark corners of the web to find yeah, him yeah, but yeah. but there are a lot of whole... people like that man a lot of people have been deplatformed and taken down because of their views and a lot of them are from our kind of communities like ron paul's channel just recently got taken off youtube and um, he's a really? he's a big advocate of these ideas yeah 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 oh gee i met ron paul of, like, a warning. Uh, yes i did i did i met ron paul but yeah, i love his work okay so i was going to say so before we get into this i guess the because like we we've been referring to this everything that's happening now in the world is medical tyranny i'm pretty sure if anyone in my circle even hears that word they're going to be like what are you talking about right now what do you mean there's like a virus out there right now that's killing everyone it's on the news the prime minister the president the whole world the pharmaceutical companies my doctor everybody is telling me that if i go outside and i see some guy without a mask or if he's not vaccinated i'm down i'm dead <laughs> so what the hell is uh what are you talking about medical tyranny right now i see a bunch of really good people doing their job yeah man i think that the way we need to understand this is by just looking at the science okay it's one uh, of course i would place rights as coming before science even like rights are the lens through which we should be making rules or laws about uh, scientific area like science or something should not trump uh, individual rights so that's why the the first half of this is important but now that we have some kind of uh, background into rights and at least what my perspective is on that and i'm sure yours is as well understanding the science really helps a lot okay because it's clear that there's some facts that are clear after one and a half years of this medical emergency being uh, shoved down our throat one of them is that uh, look i'm not a virus denier okay uh, so a lot of people in our community like the health freedom movement and all they kind of verge on this idea that viruses don't exist and it's it's all just terrain bro and this is like this kind of tropes like it's all your body man just everything is just detox and like any health issue faces is just your body trying to remove these toxins i don't subscribe to that um, i have a background in medicine and biochemistry so i actually have studied like how infectious agents work and cause issues in the body and i have i deal with patients who come to me with these issues so i i don't subscribe to that camp so i'm not a virus denier but uh, i would say that uh, when it comes to infectious agents it's always a two way street okay the the, pro- the problem with our conventional medical system is portraying these things as if it's just a, like these things that are one sided or is just one vector like it's just a virus and it's so scary that no matter what you do to your body or what you do to improve your own health it's irrelevant okay it's largely irrelevant although they they give some lip service here and there to vitamin d or once in a while that also they they won't like give it any there won't be any kind of rules based around science that actually values the importance of the body or how we can improve our host factors to improve our resilience against these infectious agents but studying the science in detail i'm pretty sure that this virus that that has circulated around the world and has caused the issues in vulnerable people it ha- it has a lab origin i'm i'm very i'm pretty confident about that tracing them even the political side of it as well as the 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 researchers who i'm in touch with who study the genome of this and who who have all kinds of critiques about where these insertions are placed and why why that's very unlikely to take place naturally that's my opinion on that but even though i believe that this is a engineered thing okay some people think that this came out by accident even people who subscribe to this idea i'm saying like some people believe it came out by accident some people think it was released by intention now if you ask me i think it is released by intention because of my uh, study of uh, the forces that are in charge of a lot of this and how long this has been on the books for like people just think that it's something that just came out of somewhere and like all this stuff this happened randomly to you know respond to this viral outbreak but if you trace the history back to this and you actually do the research and do a lot of the ground work that that these entities did to build us up to the situation it's very clear that this is something that's planned for a very long time in order to uh, push an agenda okay I, i can describe this in terms of talking about this technique called problem reaction solution 
So uh, if you think from a controller's perspective, if you put yourself in the shoes of a government bureaucrat or a technocrat and you think, okay, uh, what's a what's a condition in which I can actually do what I want to do, but disguise it as something that the people want. Okay, so let's say I want to destroy your business. Okay, I'm a big businessman who has bought politicians in the government and now I'm, I want to use my influence to actually shut your small business down. So my large corporation can flourish. So how am I going to do that? If I'm just going to buy off some politician and pass a law that's blatantly going to do that, a lot of people are going to get red flags. Okay. And they're going to see that, okay, this is not something that the politicians did in our favor. It's being done on the behalf of big business. And although that, 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 that kind of influence does get exercised, but it would be best if I could come up with a situation or if I could take advantage of a situation that already exists in the world uh, to portray my agenda in a way that actually suits the public interest. So the illusion that it suits the public interest. So if I can scare the world with a viral outbreak and if I want to destroy a business, that's a much better reason I can use, right? To actually shut you down instead of telling you that I don't want you to exist because my business profits are being threatened. So it's something similar that the controllers and, and the cabal that, that they have and the interconnections that exist between these different facets of, of the global domination cult. Okay, There's, it's just basically the, the, the cult of these families that have been conspiring together for a very long time. If you trace the history back, you can trace their plans uh, and, and their kind of intentions back 100, 200 years back. Okay, there are authors like Aldous Huxley, uh, Julie, uh, you know, sorry, Aldous Huxley as well, George Orwell. There are people like Jack Attali, who was the one of the influential people in France, I think is the president of France at one point. There's people like people who have written books like The Open Conspiracy, like H.G. Wells. These people have documented in detail what the agenda is that they want to unleash on the world. And it, it mainly boils down to a technocratic kind of world where we get rid of politicians, we get rid of the, the judicial system, and we give the power to these uh, unelected technocrats that basically decide everything what's, that's going to happen in the world. There's no free market. Okay, so everything we've been speaking about in this podcast about self-ownership, property rights, having a free market, a competitive market, where no no single business or institution has a monopoly on anything. Okay, they they tot- these technocrats totally want to get rid of that and they want to bring in a system where they have the ultimate authority to actually control people's life. This is going to move towards a resource-based economy. This is what they want to introduce, wherein a couple of these pe- central people actually monopolize all the resources on the planet. They give it this name of collective ownership. Like, okay, we own it on behalf of all of you all. And now uh, looking at the the, the kind of climate scare that's, that's going to, the propaganda again, that is going to start. So they want to control our life and basically uh, snatch all our fundamental rights away, the uh, natural rights that basically I described the right to self-ownership, bodily autonomy. Uh, They want to take all of that away and they want to move us into a society which is totally 24-7 24-7 surveillance. They want to merge technology in, inside our bodies and in, into our minds as well. So there, there's this uh, level of, uh, you know, autonomy that goes away. My auto, sorry, autonomy over my own body and my own mind. They want to snatch that away as well. So this is not just about my rights in the physical domain, but also what kind of ability I have to exercise independent thought, to be able to free, uh, freely think. A lot of this is already impacted by the censorship and the information restriction that we're seeing in today's society that big tech is engaging in or these governments are engaging in, but they want to make it even more extreme. They want to come to a point where there are brain chips inside the brain and there's all kinds of tech that they want to roll out that base. And they'll, they'll push all of this as superhuman stuff. Okay. Look, you can download a book into your head. So it's so cool, man. But uh, what they don't realize is that this tech will come with a rider where it's, if it's like a, it's not just a one way connection. You can have all these abilities, but it's also like someone might have the ability to exercise control of your own thoughts or manipulate your emotions in certain ways. They have a lot of tech they've developed wherein they can actually inject certain nanotech into the body and be able to deliver drugs on demand. So the kind of system they're engaging with the surveillance uh, tyranny and all these health IDs and stuff that's coming out is they want to uh, structure a system where they know everything about you. And then they use the central bank digital currencies and uh, social credit scores and all of that to basically just make you a lab rat or some kind of guinea pig in the system wherein, okay, if, if we think it's wrong for you to do this, then we cut you off from your, you should be engaging in this kind of behavior. You should do exactly what we tell you to do. That's the kind of system, the overarching system they want to create. And it might sound far out to someone who just hears it first, but it's becoming increasingly obvious day by day. And they, they've given it names like, the, you know, they've called it the great reset. 
the fourth fourth industrial revolution. Uh, the new world order is a term that con- people who've been researching this conspiracy have been using for a very long time. They've given it basic names, uh, different names, but it all comes down to a basic thing about en- en- unleashing this agenda on the world where everyone's uh, rights are just taken away and this totally technocratic system that's enacted on the planet. So how this ties into the entire subject around uh, the health tyranny we're facing today is that if we go to understand the science behind it, as I said, the, some facts are clear. Okay, asymptomatic people don't spread infection. So there is no point in locking everyone down. Okay, even if you believe in a deadly virus, and even if you see the history of all the past uh, epidemics and pandemics that have taken place, we never shut everyone down because some people are sick. They would do contact tracing or whatever. They'd find some people who had symptoms which are unique to the kind of issue they're dealing with. And then they would uh, restrict their movement until they got fine. And then they, they can go out and interact with society again. And this is why lockdowns haven't worked, right? It's one thing that they shouldn't be enacted either on scientific grounds or on moral grounds. But it's another thing that they don't work and they don't work because asymptomatic people don't spread disease. So if you're going to shut everyone down, it's not going to make any difference. The disease is mainly spreading in symptomatics who are mostly in care homes or in hospitals or most asymptomatic people sit at home. Tomorrow, if I got a respiratory infection, I wouldn't be fucking go- going around, uh, sorry, like mind my language, but I wouldn't be going around and uh, interacting with people in some way or trying to pass my infection to them. I would like common sense, even before this pandemic, if I got a respiratory infection, I would stay far away from any elderly people. I would just mostly stay at home and get fine and then go out in society. Okay. So firstly, these lockdowns don't work because the asymptomatic people don't spread disease. This is very unequal. After yeah, one and a half year of good science being done on this, naturally immune people don't need to get vaccinated. Okay. So, if I've contracted this virus naturally, which most people have done, actually, in fact, since it's a easily spread aerosolized virus, most people have actually contracted it since the last one and a half years. So there's no additional benefit to vaccinating these people. Okay. Because you, you vaccinate someone before they get the infection. Like this is common sense, man. I don't know like how all of this stuff has just been thrown in the gutter, but even like I, I've been involved in anti-vaccine debates before this, before this entire medical emergency came about. The debates I would always have with people who like really staunchly believed in vaccines would be that, okay, natural immunity is better. Like they would always acknowledge that natural immunity is better than vaccine immunity. But the argument always came down to, okay, vaccine immunity won't give you a full-blown infection. Natural immunity or like contracting the virus actually has a chance of you developing a full-blown infection and suffering greatly from that. And that's the argument in which the debate took place. But no pro-vaxxer ever denied that and natural immunity was inferior or didn't exist or whatever it is that these people are trying to do with respect to natural immunity today. Like the WHO actually removed natural immunity from its uh, guidelines. And because they got so much pressure after that, they actually had to add it back and recognize that herd immunity can be achieved via natural immunity or vaccines. It's, it's not just vaccines as a lot of people think today. So that's a very, very clear fact. Like this is the most undeniable, even the most vehement uh, pro-vaxxer or the the person who's scared of uh, a virus can't deny this fact that fighting a war with the actual thing, okay, you're vaccinating someone because you want to give them a part of the enemy so that when the full enemy comes, he's prepared in some way to fight the enemy. But if I've already fought the whole bloody enemy, like why why do you want to give me like his arm or his leg or something like that when I've actually fought the whole person and and come out successfully from that? I, my, my immune system has memory against all the different epitopes of that virus. So you're not going to get any benefit by giving a small part of that, like one spike protein. When my natural immunity has uh, protective immunity against the nucleocapsid, against the spike, against like all these different regions of the virus. So that's just something that's, that's so far out that these people are trying to push that even if you're natural, like these, this is the kind of rhetoric that propagandists are using today from their side. That even if you have natural immunity, your, your antibodies will wane after some point. You need to be given a vaccine so they come back up. But this is also based on the flawed concept of not understanding memory. Okay, like antibodies don't need to exist in your bloodstream all the time. They need to exist when your body is trying to fight an infection, which is why when I see sick people, okay, when in my clinic, when sick people come to me and I look at the blood work, the people who are the most sick have the highest level of antibodies. Okay, whether that's from an autoimmune uh, disease or from an infection. Like when I do these uh, panels where I look at IgG antibodies for infections, when the antibody levels are high, it suggests that that there's an infection, there's a a resurgence of the infection that's come about. Okay, so 
antibodies will come in your body when your body is trying to fight something okay when these viral antigens aren't floating around in the air or they aren't coming into your body you don't need to have these antibodies all the time so it's but natural that these are going to wane after some point and immunity is not just centered around antibodies you also have t cells and other kind of specialized cells that also are involved in a natural innate immune response so this entire uh, kind of narrow equivalence of immunity to antibodies is totally flawed scientifically if you just read the medical literature on this is it's very clear and uh, even to suggest that they wane after some point your b cells and t cells have memory so it's not if you got exposed to this any antibody levels waned then you won't be able to make it the next time an infection comes around you have memory so your antibodies will be made on demand like whenever it comes around your immune system will have the memory to just make it much faster than you contracted it the first time like when you contract it for the first time your immune system has never recognized that virus before so it takes time for that whole process to kick in and for you to make that but once you actually contract it it's very quick like it'll just come up when the so agent shows up the next time so there has been huge conspiracy to deny vaccine immunity which is very clear like okay and a lot of people shy away from this term conspiracy or conspiracy theory but even the skeptics i've looked into the the work of a lot of people like people like michael shermer and these so self professed skeptics who who just try to debunk every single conspiracy that they can find their hands on and i think the biggest flaw in in this hardcore rationalist skeptical kind of thinking is to to totally deny the importance of thinking about motives okay when it comes to motives and uh, people's intentions on things you can't you can't go by hard science or only uh, causal evidence like you know confirmatory causal evidence you have to use inferences you have to like circumstantial evidence becomes very important like even when we're going to court right now and if we're trying to prove a conspiracy is just a few people can like having some agreement in secret to to engage in a plan that's either illegal or something that will benefit them at the expense of everyone else that's the literal definition of a conspiracy i don't understand why people shy away from that term or try to distance themselves from conspiracy people who you know try to work on these issues but just uh, understanding that i think that it's, it's a big denial of intentions because as i said when we go to court the our, our laws itself acknowledge that when you're trying to prove a criminal conspiracy which is what every policeman or investigator is doing like when a policeman is trying to rob a criminal okay he doesn't just have hard evidence to start out with like you start out with circumstantial evidence okay that the murderer was in the area he was in the cctv of the guy who got killed so that there's a chance and then you zero in on that guy and you try to find more harder evidence so you can't just deny if, if there's criminality being engaged on a global scale and there are some people who are conspiring by using their power and wealth to create certain systems that are going to like deprive us of our rights you you have to think with circumstantial evidence as well you can't just try to debunk everything by using hard evidence so i think that's the problem that i see in a lot of people who even try to debunk these issues and the kind of retorts that i come across but as sticking to the science i think it's very clear if i can just wrap up the, the mass don't work there's a lot of randomized control trials that have happened on mass and they they just aren't effective against viral infections and they have a lot of side effects they come with as well the rt pcr test that they're using all over the world it has a lot of issues i think it's the crux of this whole issue because when people think okay look look the common response or retort i get is that you don't have anyone in your family who died from covid i had someone and it's very emotional and you should go ask them or you should ask me what i went through that's an appeal to emotion right it's not really a rational line of argument although i empathize with these people but they've been uh, manipulated into actually using their emotion as a way to be cheerleaders of suppressing other people's rights okay that's how the psychological warfare specialists have used these people who faced genuine issues in their family of because someone died from an infectious agent or, or died because of complications with an infectious agent they using them as mouthpieces to really go around and restrict everyone and to destroy everyone else's lives that's the biggest problem i see because when you ask these people okay how do you know this your relative or someone died uh, from covid they'll, they'll usually tell you my doctor said so and if you try to think about how the doctor said so it's it's mostly based on the pcr okay the, this is what they using to diagnose death certificates all over the world they just it's so egregious that in places like uk and other countries they actually just uh, need you to have a, a pcr positive within 28 days of dying and if that's happened like before 28 days of your death you need to have a pcr positive and if that's taken place then you automatically put in the covid death category so they have such weak 
levels of causality assessment that need to be justified in order to say that someone died from a virus but when you talk about a vaccine death okay if someone has got vaccinated and they died a few hours after that then no it it could be he had heart disease from before he had a sedentary lifestyle he didn't exercise he did all this stuff and then they remember everything like all, all the comorbidities come up no, no, we had- do. in ontario they literally have and i think this is the case in a lot of places everywhere i've looked if you get the vaccine and you get sick the next day you're not considered to be a part of the vaccinated you're unvaccinated because it takes the vaccine 14 days to take effect don't you see <laughs> it's like what that this is i oh my goodness dude i okay so yes keep keep going it's just like a big ass magic show right they're, look over here woo, and they're just oh my goodness okay what people else stop thinking man yeah like i, I just think the people survivability are, rate can you talk about that in general isn't it like isn't this is like 99.99 something nine like i think there's more atoms yeah, in the that's universe the or something fatality rate. <laughs> yeah that's the infection fatality rate so i think what some people in the authorities try to confuse people is they actually use the they they mixed up CFR with IFR. So there are two terms used in epidemiology, wherein uh, CFR is actually the case fatality rate. Okay, so that is how many people died compared to how many people tested positive. And uh, the denominator for that is uh, usually low because you only typically test people if they're symptomatic or they come to you to get tested. Because of that, the CFR number does look very big. If people remember in the beginning, the WHO was saying that a COVID has a death rate of 3%. Or something, and then influenza just has a death rate of one percent. So they were actually conflating CFR with IFR, which is actually very criminal. Uh, whereas the IFR, which is the infection fatality rate, is the actual death rate that looks at how many people died divided by the number of people who tested positive with antibodies. Okay, so that's a much better way of measuring infections in a community because what they do is they go around doing antibody tests of everyone in in a certain community. So even people who haven't shown symptoms, okay, you can get to know if they asymptomatically got infected. Like this is possible, okay. It, is, it might sound totally far out to people who are just watching TV news 24-7, but uh, I'm, I'm surprised if any of these people are still sticking around to listen to this. <laughs> but contrary to the idea that everyone who gets this virus is going to succumb or get symptoms, most people on the planet have got this and have developed no symptoms. Okay, that's, that's where most people on the planet are of very mild symptoms. Okay, just like a flu or a sort of the taste and smell goes away for a couple of days and comes back, like issues like that. Okay, a little bit different than a typical flu, but not that severe typically. So, the, as you spoke to rightly, if you see the last infection fatality rate that was calculated in a study done by John Unitas, it's around 0.15 percent. Okay, that's the infection fatality rate globally, like where you know, and he based that off of zero prevalence data where they looked at people's antibodies in different countries. Okay, and like when, when he averaged around 50 55 countries average, he came up to a number of 0.15 percent. And this is not even adjusting for age. If you adjust by age, if you, if you take the under 20 group, their IFR is some three decimals out or four decimals out, you know, like zero point zero 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 something. Okay, and so, this is so where no, you most- should be worried if you're 90 plus and if you have two comorbidities, and I think if you're morbidly obese, if the, all those factors are in, in play. In general, if you have uh, if you have blood sugar issues or some kind mm. of insulin resistance, uh, like a comorbidity, or, uh, most diseases, like since I come from a functional medicine uh, perspective, hmm. most diseases I think have their root in insulin resistance. I think that's where a lot of issues start. And vegetable oils are a big culprit in that. The seed oils that uh, you know people have become so widespread in society today. I think they're at the root of insulin resistance through my own research. So uh, it's people who have. Uh, diabetic conditions or who generally have health issues uh, who have blood pressure issues like they they are more susceptible and it's not like even these people get the virus and all of them die like even these people have a death rate like even if a person has diabetes and he does contract it it might be a little bit more severe he might just get a normal infection but some of these people get more se- serious infections and they have to be dealt with but the 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 good news is that we have effective drugs uh, and you know it, to, to talk about drugs also <laughs> Brings horse, up horse, the notion horse medicine. of uh, <laughs> horse, horse liver and things like that. But yeah, I mean, 
Did you see? So did you see? Did you see Joe Rogan yeah. calling out Sanjay Gupta yesterday? I did. I did. I that was watching so that. That is so good, and that's what uh, gave that me the confidence good. to finally be like, yeah. you know what? Come on, Joe Rogan is talking about it like every day. He can't be the only one fighting this, and uh, yeah, 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 not, man. There's a, there's yeah. A do you have a do you have a few more minutes, Johan? Yeah. Or are you gonna do you have a hard stop in ten minutes? Just curious. No, right? no, no. I don't. I don't. Do? Okay, cool, cool. Because I want to go over a bit because there's a bunch of topics I want to cover. Okay, so first of all, should we maybe get into your report a little bit as well? And I yeah. just want to throw out there: there's a couple of things I wanted to ask you about Uttar Pradesh. Supposedly, they had some spiritual leaders as a part of the political thing and then they decided to do door-to-door early treatment ivermectin and it's like the population of the united states so i don't know at one point i'd love to touch on that but also i want to dive into the meat of this recent thing that you put together and and what it what the thesis is and yeah and and i want to educate people about it yeah, so this comes into the the scientific things that, that we know about. Like when we are discussing about this, I told you that we know asymptomatic people don't spread. We know masks, uh, you know, are pretty ineffective and have side effects. We know the testing, like the RT PCR, isn't the gold standard for the testing, and it 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 can be improved by certain ways in which the cycle threshold can be brought down, and you can use better tests like virus culture tests and things like that. So. The science is, is pretty clear on some of these issues, which are very fundamental, but uh, this also brings up the issue of effective treatment. Okay, so this is where we tie in this part of the conversation to that. And even the, the piece I wrote on the task force. Okay, so uh, what people need to understand is that there have been many effective treatments. Frontline physicians have been working uh, since this whole issue started to try to understand the physiology behind SARS-CoV-2 infections, to try to understand how the virus is exactly replicating and what are its properties. And so we can develop effective treatments. So towards that front, if you see the FLCCC group, the Frontline Critical Care Alliance, they've developed this uh, great math protocol that uh, does, they added ivermectin recently, like two, three months back. But it's they are basically using methylprednisolone, ascorbic acid, that's vitamin C, uh, thiamine, as well as heparin. That's a blood thinner. These kind of t- issues have been used and there's a way to use them. Typically, uh, a lot of people have died from wrong treatment because of using drugs like remdesivir, which there's clear evidence on now that it doesn't reduce hospitalization, but actually comes with a bunch of side effects like remdesivir actually failed the trials of Ebola as well. And it, had, it did very badly in the trials for SARS-CoV-2 also, where they basically, they've done trials on remdesivir where it showed that a lot of people developed kidney failure in that. So uh, because of that, also people have been having lung issues because the kidneys aren't able to remove the water out and it actually lands up filling the lungs. So there's a lot of issues that have taken place because of wrong treatment as well. And if people had access to the right treatments, I think it's pretty clear now that ivermectin is very effective. Nebulizing hydrogen peroxide very early is very effective. Zinc lozenges very early is very effective. So the, the, the key to this whole thing is even if people are comorbid and they're facing issues, like having access to the right treatment, being prepared beforehand. And if symptoms do start to manifest, like you start to get viral respiratory issues, like just hitting it right, like when it starts is the way out. So I'll give you a personal anecdote of this. Of course, it's an NF1. But uh, when I got a SARS-CoV-2 infection in Feb of, of 2020, like I got it very early on. And I knew it was a SARS-CoV-2 infection because it wasn't like a typical flu. Like I, it was mainly lung involvement and a lot of dry coughing. And I didn't have any shortness of breath or anything like that. But uh, I probably would have had it hadn't I used some of the things I use that, but uh, I'm not someone, uh, you know, with severe health issues, but in general, I've had a problem with uh, heavy metal toxicity as well as uh, high levels of inflammation in the body. So that does weaken the immune response. And at at that particular time of uh, part point of time, I wasn't eating too well. I was not like getting enough sleep. I was drinking alcohol quite a bit at that time or smoking as well. So uh, like a lot of those things actually land, landed up making me succumb to uh, a SARS-CoV-2 infection. But I was able to like very effectively deal with it by just consuming zinc lozenges. I literally, I didn't do anything else. There's these uh, brilliant cheap zinc acetate lozenges that come where it's basically, it's the right form of zinc. So you can't just use any other form of zinc. You need to use the zinc acetate form. Uh, because that's that's what's effective in terms of killing the viruses in your respiratory tract and these are like lozenges that slowly dissolve in your mouth and they they've sweetened them with uh, like natural sweetener so you don't have that kind of aftertaste of metallic taste of zinc as well and i just took that and i was literally like able to kill my symptoms in two three days like whenever i would take the lozenge just like the, the coughing would stop had i taken the lozenge earlier like had i taken it just when i got my first cough or when i started ish- noticing that i was having that then it would have been much more effective although, but I, I waited a day. I was like, 
coughing for a day and i had fever and all and then next day i started so even despite i started on the second day i was able to take it away in two three days okay and it's like when i was taking it the symptoms would go if i would take the lozenge for for that much time like half an hour one hour my symptoms would go and they would come back or take another one then they'd go again so and like this is i know this because this is the most effective thing for killing colds as well like this is something i have on my hand all the time before as well there there's effective stuff like this has been suppressed and it's it's been suppressed because they these this cartel of which i call the vaccine mafia and my peace also their own their only and sole agenda is to push vaccines and deny all of the effective treatments so that they can give these vaccines emergency use authorization which they've got and they wouldn't have been able to give them this eua were it not if they actually acknowledge that there are effective treatments that exist like if for a vaccine to be effective you just need 50% efficacy <laughs> if you like for for them to give a vaccine a eua you just have to cross 50% so if that's the bar that can be extended to other things also like there'd be so many drugs today that have much more than 50% efficacy like i they've done trials like they've, they've done clinical trials on covid on iodine okay and actually like, you gargling with your in your mouth and rinsing your nose with covid on iodine like three four times a day it actually reduced the risk of death by 80% okay and the vaccine trials is not even look for that the vaccine trials are mainly looking the end points for the vaccine trials were mainly like if you develop a positive pcr or if you have mild symptoms those were the end points but the trials for some of these natural substances they've actually looked at if they can reduce deaths or not in a significantly sized population not like they look at it for five people or something it's in the hundreds at least we have many clinical trials and randomized control trials that they performed on substances like black seed oil like uh, turmeric even like uh, raw honey like povidone iodine like ivermectin like vitamin d which actually show us reductions in death rates okay that there's a the trial that they did you know this amino acid called arginine as well where they were able to show reductions in death rates after the person developed a respiratory infection like after they had hypoxic uh, you know respiratory issues they were given a certain dose of arginine and the, the intervention group actually had a much lower risk of death compared to the group that was not given this so there's a lot of science like that it's not been spoken about and people typically don't tend to go and read the scientific literature because they they're not very well versed with this stuff and they they typically tend to rely on media reporting of the science like a lot of the sci- this actual science that's done is in medical journals okay which which 99% people don't read like people just go to cnn or they go to bbc and then they will read the reporting on the selective studies that they want to portray to the people okay so they don't present all the science and they don't present it in, in an unbiased way also a lot of times they will uh, use statistics to manipulate people so uh, this is the the piece with respect to ivermectin and it ties into the task force because this task force that are exposed in my piece okay basically what i've done is uh, expose the names of the people in the national task force of india's who's directing india's public health policy with respect to the covid-19 situation they've been responsible for everything man from uh, locking down an entire country destroying the lives of uh, and liberties of millions of people forcing masks on people like asm like doing forceful testing in train stations and bus stands and all these kind of egregious policies that not only erode our civil liberties but also like come at a great cost with respect to health uh, repercussions as, as well as with respect to the the finances that are being stolen from us through taxes as well as directly as well they've been responsible for all of this so in my research it was very surprising for me to find that we the like india didn't know the names of these people it's just crazy when you think about it because fauci has been all in the headlines since last year and the heat has gone directly to him because he's the one responsible for suggesting report and directing the entire us response to covid and there are similar health bureaucrats that are there in different countries but in india since it's such a large country i i think what they saw is that if they landed up focusing uh, on one person or uh, one two people the backlash that would happen in in case some kind of awakening took place would be massive like i think these people would probably be gullied or you know their heads would be chopped off in public or something is thinking about how much damage they have caused to life so i this is more speculative on mind is just like my own thinking on this but i think this is the reason why in india they really made it difficult for people to figure out who's who's doing what okay so they set up like 10 15 different committees all across the country there's one committee that will decide on uh, assessing vaccine safety there's another that will decide on vaccine r&d production getting into deals with businesses there's another committee that's like the task force that decides on other things there's a committee on uh, media management and communication strategy there's a committee on 
like empower groups on different kinds of things there's a separate committee of bureaucrats that's advising the prime minister there's a principal scientific advisor that's advising him so it's like if you try to research this from a lay person's perspective and you just try to research this online by doing like google search terms you will land up like scratching your head and just give up okay because you won't be able to figure out who's doing what because they've muddied up the waters in such a way and a lot of the committees they don't actually disclose the names so they just leave it as like these vague administrative bodies that is like driven by some expert that's the impression they sell to people like experts are driving these bodies so they know what's best and they are taking the shots on all this and they don't actually tell you the names but the most influential and the most kind of uh, the committee that actually has the shots the goal to call the shots on all these areas is the national covid task force so this is a 21 member committee as i said whose names were known in my research piece i've referenced a lot of the media articles that when they try to talk about the national task force they they'll always quote an anonymous person okay they the, i've referenced some articles in my piece wherein this journalist goes and interviews this member of the task force and uh, they request for anonymity and stuff so they want to be secret and even the government has kept them secret for a very long time but uh, because uh, i have a background in researching this as i said i've been doing this stuff for the last 5 6 years and i understand the controllers and the way in which they've infiltrated health systems around the world so i was able to very easily relate that to india as well and i knew the areas in which i had to focus my research or you know what i need to look for and extend that and find more data so because of that i was able to find the names of these people like it, it was buried somewhere in one of our government agencies archives behind in their website and i found the names but not only did i find the names i also showed in my article how these people have grave conflicts of interest okay like the lot of these committee people they keep repeatedly coming in the media they are in the task force as well then they'll go and sit in the committee which decides which vaccines are approved in the country they'll also go and sit in the committee which decides adverse events after vaccine so there's a committee in india which decides which adverse events have taken place after a vaccine and if they're connected to the vaccine or not so they will go and sit in this committee as well then they they have some kind of affiliation with pharma companies they, a lot of the research is sponsored by the gates foundation directly or wellcome trust or world bank or usaid or any of these globalist institutions that's connected to the global deep state that's that's ultimately behind all the stuff i have not just shown who these who the names are of course they're very influential names if you the most prominent ones would be people like shina threddy uh, narendra arora gagandeep kang uh, vinod paul then you have vijay ra k vijay raghu and you have randeep guleria balram bhargava so these are like the top 7 8 bureaucrats and technocrats that are really have grave conflicts of interest like i, I don't have the time obviously to go into each of their conflicts but if you just go and research the piece you will see that they repeatedly come in the media uh, they repeatedly are in bed with the pharma companies or this illegal ngo complex and then they are also going and sitting in prime bodies in the government that's really dictating what's happening with respect to policy in the country my my piece is very in depth but in a nutshell it's is just exposing how the people who've controlled 1.3 billion people indian people's lives with respect to everything that's taken place like uh, every single person in the task force as well as there are other people who are connected with the body called the public health foundation of india that's also in bed with pharma companies gets funding directly from uh, companies like pfizer from johnson and johnson Uh, from gates foundation from the rockefeller foundation so there's this public private partnership that was set up in india by gates himself like bill gates actually started this ppp called the phfi in 2006 wherein he infused 650 million rupees into it he got the government to infuse 650 million taxpayer money and then some private billionaires in india also funded it uh, to a large extent and they actually created an institution where they hijacked the government body so if you if this institution actually on its governing board has the top bureaucrats of our country who are calling the shots and who are coming in the tv repeatedly to convey to people the science behind covid and all that they have hijacked these people totally okay so they have people who are heads of our ministry of health and family welfare heads of the indian council of medical research they'll have them on the board of this public health foundation of india also on the board of the public health foundation of india are representatives of billionaires okay so the tatas the ambanis and all these people are very well represented on the page of our board and then they also have representatives from the gates foundation from mckinsey from wellcome trust from a lot of pharmaceutical companies like there's a head there's a literal head of a pharma chain in india like fortis okay they run a huge uh, chain of pharmaceutical companies and hospitals and the head of that harpal singh is actually sitting on the board of this public private partnership 
that's supposed to be created for deciding public health in india like you actually have a, uh, the head of a hospital chain that's deciding a public health policy in india or sitting on the board of a body who's deciding public health policy in india so there are the kind of grave conflicts of interest that exist in our public health system and this does make a lot of sense if you research this it will make a lot of sense to you as to why these people are getting the science wrong it's not just that they're getting the science wrong but it's because they are in bed with the people who are pushing these agendas and the people uh, you know behind the entire vaccine lobby and the pharma cartel they are ultimately deciding india's policy landscape when it comes to the legislation on all of these different things okay so yeah that's a bit of a nutshell on my task force and surprisingly not this task force is responsible for removing ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine from the national guidelines so just 10 days back the same task force that i'm talking about which is which whose whole agenda seems to be to fear monger around the virus and to push vaccines okay i've showed this also in my article like every single person in the task force and the influential people most of them if not all come out in media and they give statements like it's time to wear a mask at home all the vaccines are safe and effective but it's dangerous to rely on natural immunity or herd immunity even if you've developed herd immunity or natural immunity take the vaccine and engage in covid appropriate behavior so their narrative is the same if you research any of these task force people you'll find they have the same bloody narrative that are debunked in this entire podcast and they're all in bed with these people and they are the same people who removed ivermectin from the guidelines so now actually ivermectin use is going to get much less in india up till this point as you rightly alluded to uttar pradesh has been using ivermectin as prophylaxis for a very long time okay so they actually have had zero case rates for a very long time and they actually went and aggressively gave ivermectin as a prophylaxis to all the people who came symptomatic after they uh, went around looking for symptomatic people tested them and then if they tested positive they gave them ivermectin so because of that of course there could be other reasons involved the testing rates could be a variable over there but uh, last part of it i think uh, ivermectin is responsible for because ivermectin is very, very effective in uh, inhibiting viral replication like they've, they've done studies on this where they've seen that so it's not just like this a pa- anti parasitic drug or something a lot of drugs have off label uses okay like a lot of drugs have multi uh, you know purposes that they serve like one drug can be anti parasitic but it can also have anti inflammatory properties or have anti viral effects okay so ivermectin is one of these things that's been safely delivered to billions of people around the world and with a very negligible safety risk everything comes with a safety risk depending on the dose but ivermectin is pretty safe overall if you see yeah. with its the have, research has been done into it yeah. have you done much research on the safety risk of of the vaccines you have oh, yeah. talked about that <laughs> yeah 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 the this is an interesting conversation to have because the safety uh, kind of database in india okay if you see in america they have wears if you see uk they have the mhra in uh, europe they have utra surveillance so there are these different kinds of uh, vaccine safety monitoring systems that they set up around the world and uh, even if you look for wears there's they've done studies like the hhs in america had commissioned studies through harvard earlier where they found that uh, So there's a huge under reporting that exists within these systems like there's some uh, been some good journalism done by project veritas recently where they've interviewed whistle blowers were talking about how the system is not uh, reporting adverse events a lot of the doctors are not reporting adverse events that are hap- happening in the medical system so in india that problem is like 100 times worse like if you imagine something like wears a system that's existed for a very long time and there's been a huge vaccine skeptic community in america i wouldn't call them anti vaxxers it's derogatory to call them anti vax because we aren't anti vaxxers man like i do believe that there are ways in which we can modulate the immune system to better prepare it against you know future infections and if a safe and effective vaccine did exist like i wouldn't have any problem with that existing along with other effective treatments i just think that everything should be voluntary and nothing should be based on coercion because that's what my a uh, fundamental principles are and it's not just my principle i think these are principles that everyone should abide by because if they don't believe in the non aggression principle and the self defense principle you're a hypocrite and you don't deserve the rights you have that's what i would say to anyone who doesn't believe in these principles because they they very inherent like you you can't deny them okay if you think that you should have the right to forcefully take something from someone then why should i extend the right to you then you don't have any rights either okay so if someone values their rights then it's imperative that they have to respect other people's right to bodily autonomy and property so i think that's very clear but uh, on the ivermectin issue and and the vaccine safety issue as well india system is really messed up man firstly people don't know that adverse events can take place like a lot of the population there in some kind of trance because these people blindly trust modi and they blindly trust the medical establishment out here 
so any kind of opposition also in our country is it's mainly comes from the left okay so the the left and the right in our country all of them are on board with all the facets of the pandemic whether it's mass vaccines testing lockdowns national immunity like, like if, regardless of whether someone's a congress supporter or bjp bhakt or whatever it is they are all on board with this stuff okay there's very little disagreement between them like they all squabble over minor issues but when it comes to these fundamentals behind the scientific fraud of the pandemic they all believe in that so any kind of you know a statement coming from modi or these health bureaucrats it's is largely swallowed by most of the people okay because they think that modi can't do anything wrong like that's how sadly a lot of people think okay so because of that these people have been able to just shove people uh, shove it down people's throat this idea that vaccines are safe and effective and even though right now people are like facing heart attacks there's a huge spike of heart attacks in in my city itself not just anecdotally speaking but also in the data like the even media outlets are reporting that heart attack rates have actually uh, you know doubled like more than 50% since the peak of the second wave so if if people are watching abroad they, they must have been like propagandized with this idea that india had this huge second wave and a lot of people died and i'm not saying that didn't happen but uh, today the heart attack rates are more than the peak of the second wave okay like the heart attacks today are like d- almost double that of what took place in the second wave so people aren't making the connection because they think the vaccine is safe and effective and if, if you see the media reporting also as i said the hypocrisy and the circular reasoning with this it it just stops people like people think that okay they can see something in the face but then they will come up with reasons like okay they were not practicing covid appropriate behavior after getting vaccinated <laughs> or they had a sedentary lifestyle or they had a bad diet that's why they had so this is the kind of things that these rise in heart attacks are being attributed to which is totally fraudulent okay when you see that the vaccines have been linked to myocarditis and heart inflammation around the world there's been a rise in this in countries where they have good uh, vaccines like adverse event reporting systems we've seen temporal associations between the vaccines and uh, these issues so we know the problem does exist and there's a definite link to these vaccines but because india has such a poor reporting system the main issues people don't know and then if people do know they don't know that the, we actually have a reporting system called AEFI okay the adverse event following immunization system so in india in case anyone watching if you know someone who suffered from an adverse event you can basically take that victim go to the place where they got vaccinated and that person mandatorily has to report it if you face anything within 30 days of getting vaccinated there are government regulations on this that the person who vaccinated you has to report it they de- they generate a case reporting format then they actually send it to a higher committee that then decides the death or adverse event was from the vaccine or not so most people don't know about the system so firstly people don't know vaccines could cause side effects because people have been made to believe that it's some elixir that is just going to say save people from this deadly virus then if they do have some hesitation or they make a connection then they don't know that they have to go and report they just believe it or they might just talk about it to the friends or something so most of the people most of the adverse events have already been lost okay because uh, of these issues a lot of people are facing them they don't know it could be from the vaccine a lot of people who have faced them and who who have a hunch they don't have a, they don't have the knowledge to report it then there are some people who do know that it could be from a vaccine they do manage to go and report it but because of the dense thick head medical volunteers that exist on the ground level we have actually faced this in our own group we have known people who who had deaths in their families post vaccination they've tried to go and report it but when they go to report it that person over there no this can't be from a vaccine it's from something else and we're not going to take your report okay and we actually know a party that went twice okay this, this happened in gujarat they in ahmedabad they went once they got rejected they went another time they got rejected again and then we gave them the legal basis and then they showed it and then it finally got accepted so this is the kind of issue that people are facing in india there is this perception that vaccine adverse events are very low but if you don't if you don't advertise the bloody system and you don't tell people that this could happen then why the hell are people going to report it's not an active system it's a passive system like people have to go and report it themselves so just by pointing to the low numbers doesn't mean anything like you have to go into the factors which actually determine if the numbers that are taking place on the ground can be ac- accurately captured by your reporting system which is not happening it's a total mess in india which is why you don't get to see any of these things and if if something does come up then it's oh you conspiracy theorist you anti vaxer how can you say this happened from the vaccine how do you know that it's just like these kind of uh, arguments i get through on it yeah so this is the spectrum of 
vaccine debate in the country in general and debate around adverse events as well interesting hey just to i guess like wrap up what is like what is the tldr i guess of your report one more time if you can send me the link one more time and also sure, you know, the bitcoin address or whatever it is i'll put that in i'll put that in our show notes uh, just so that people can support you i'm sure like if you said the whole concept of like anarchy bitcoin global medical tyranny all these things are they're connected and uh, yeah, i'm a bitcoiner and i i it just recently it just all started to come together and i think most of the people who are going to watch this are probably going to be like next <laughs> even if it gets through <laughs> to a few people i think that's the goal here yeah yeah man it's we want to change one mind at a time because uh, like i've been doing this for 5 years 6 years and i've mostly got silence or condemnation or some kind of i dominant thrown at me but it's not deterred me from doing my work i know it's the truth man it, it'll eventually come out and shown to be so i think we have to keep that kind of mindset and things do turn around like it's because i've done my work and put it out and told people five years back what's going to happen that i have a lot of credibility now in my own circles because i, mm. I was able to accurately tell them what's going to happen and like effectively predict the future in a way with respect to the task force the tldr on that is based on all the information the conflicts of interest we have actually teamed up with lawyers who are the indian bar association so i'd actually like to speak about them also a little bit Please. because they've done fantastic work actually uh, so there's this lawyer called nilesh oja and his wife dipali oja uh, dipali oja has actually become very famous abroad because she's done interviews with very famous uh, ivermectin doctors like she's been on an interview with pia cory and tess lorry who are big proponents of ivermectin in uk and in america uh, i think pia cory was also on joe rogan some time back so this law, you know our lawyers have actually done interviews with uh, these top people abroad pushing ivermectin very aggressively and uh, we are actually connected with them after i came to know about this entire ivermectin controversy like i, I knew about ivermectin from before but the fact that uh, these lawyers who live 10 minutes away from me actually sent a legal notice to the chief scientist of the who i, I got to know after i came across them so i was i was delighted to go and meet them and then it was a great meeting of minds because i had read a notice that she sent to somya and based on that notice actually somya saminathan deleted a tweet on ivermectin so somya saminathan had actually put a tweet out saying that look ivermectin is this and that and even the company that made it is saying that it's not effective that's what she tweeted and after that she had to like delete her tweet after she sent a legal notice for that and the notice basically made her accountable for a mass murder and genocide <laughs> it might sound hilarious but it's what it is if you are suppressing a treatment that's so effective and there's so much science around it and you're engaging in propaganda to mm. influence state to not have it in your policy and because of that people are losing so many lives then you are a mass murderer man i don't know what way to put, and what other way we could put it so after that note i really connected with them and they've already they they had their world view very in like in line with us with respect to all these issues but they didn't have that a scientific deep dive or the the kind of scientific you know facts which would help them to actually take this forward so that's somewhere that i and my team i'm working with actually filled fill that in for them it's mainly me and another friend called lumber who we've been going to the office and working long hours with them and we've managed to put together a big legal resistance out here so i've been connected with other lawyers also like there are some popular lawyers in india one of them is prashant bhushan he has a following of 2 million on twitter we worked with him behind the scenes and uh, helped him out with data and he actually took a case against mandates to the supreme court uh, a couple of months back and there's a hearing also that happened on that and i, I can speak about all these issues but it'll take me a lot of time so i'm just summarizing but we are in touch with prashant bhushan we are in touch with colin gonzalez who is another big human rights lawyer in india who's done a lot of work on this issue so we are we are mainly working with prashant and colin before and they've done some great work like through colin's uh, human rights law network we were able to get some judgments from like four five northeastern high courts and uh, we got fantastic judgments from the judges over there and the judges basically ruled that you it's illegal to differentiate between a vaccinated and unvaccinated person and this is totally arbitrary a vaccinated person can also be a super spreader he can also uh, get infected he can also die after getting the vaccine so there's no basis for any kind of discrimination and you can't deprive someone of a job or travel or anything like that if they've not got vaccinated so we actually managed to get these judgments from four to five different high courts in the northeast wow. but the supreme court big battle like we uh, prashant bhushan actually filed a petition in the supreme court mm. in may 
okay so it's been a couple of months since then and we helped in the data for that petition as well so his one of his hearings came up and the judges were very, very biased okay the the judge was saying things like the who was saying vaccine hesitancy is the biggest threat to the world and you know if we entered any of petition then we would be uh, uh, lending a year to that or something so these are the kind of silly arguments they came up with so judges were already biased from before that's the issue or uh, i would have a hunch that a lot of the judges are corrupt because uh, if you go and see my youtube channel i actually accused the chief justice of india 2 3 weeks back on my channel like openly i have not got a contempt case filed against me or anything like typically when you insult a judge or something and you uh, publicly attack them you immediately have a contempt case filed against you which is criminal like you could go to jail for that but i, I have not got any kind of contempt case from the chief justice of india yet but uh, what i discovered in my own research is that his mother uh, who who passed away in 2017 she was holding shares in a company called bharat biotech that's making these vaccines and his mother also had a kind of a penchant for vaccine companies because she also had shares in another company that is making vaccines for animals so she passed away in 2017 but the law of the supreme court and uh, you know the law of the land in india is very clear that if a judge has any direct or indirect relation with a case that he is either directly going to hear or he is going to appoint that case as a chief justice the job is to appoint the case to an appropriate bench if the if the chief justice has any kind of relation then he has to step down or recuse himself from the appointing of such a case and he's supposed to give it to someone else who then appointed to an appropriate bench who doesn't have such a connection so with the chief justice of india uh, he has very, very cozy relationships with the heads of this company that are making this vaccine and the heads of this company have very, very intimate connections with bill gates directly like this guy i'm talking about his name is krishna ayla he is the md of bharat biotech that made the this vaccine called covaxin in india so if you try to understand this conflict okay this nv ramanna he that's the name of the uh, chief justice his mother held shares in this company nv ramanna actually when he goes on visits to visit a temple or something he privately goes and meets the md of this company and his wife okay in a private capacity at a guest house or something so you can think about how cordial the relationships are and this guy is literally responsible for the deaths and uh, But the delay in justice has taken place. Okay, our lawyers use a very good line that is justice delayed is justice denied. Okay, so every single day that this the, the Supreme Court is not passing an order or issuing some kind of interim relief against vaccine mandates. Okay, because if you if you study the landscape in India, every single almost every single collector or state is passing some kind of order or some all these businesses are passing orders and pressing the, the employees. If you don't get vaccinated, you can't come to job tomorrow. or if you don't get vaccinated you can't travel in mumbai so they've banned people who haven't been vaccinated from using the local trains so all these kind of illegal orders are being passed when the central government is openly coming out and saying at a national level that vaccines are totally voluntary and you can't deny someone uh, from a service or a right a fundamental if they haven't got vaccinated and the supreme court refuses to intervene in this matter and they're just delaying the matter so that's the landscape with respect to the supreme court we've done our best to take it to that level and that case is still ongoing there was an other case i worked on for the supreme court that actually you know hasn't even been hasn't even come up before a bench yet that's the case i put my the most amount of my hard work in so we actually worked with uh, colin gonzalez who's the uh, director of the human rights law network that's a very big uh, law network uh, based in delhi is headquartered in delhi and uh, he actually worked with us for 10 days day and night we worked we compiled the data and we were actually i was in of like physically present in delhi working at his office and we put that together and we filed it in the supreme court in may around the same time prashant bhushan's matter was also filed which i also helped in but i mainly put a lot of work into this petition and they did not even take that petition up like it's, it's just been in cold storage for the last i think 5 6 months man so this is the kind of capture of our judiciary also that we've seen today and uh, like all i'm waiting for is some kind of confrontation because i have i've exposed all these billionaires in my videos i've i've basically named names i've shown how these people are getting funded i've i'm going to start a big twitter campaign soon to directly call out these people who have ruined our lives so i i've just basically been ignored okay because like i've been addressed in the media only uh, when it was for my case like we filed a case recently in bombay high court which was for removing the circulars that basically demand the people to get vaccinated to a travel by train then we also challenging all the other vaccine coercion that's taking place in maharashtra so that's the only time my name came in the media but other than that is like silence like they they just 
don't acknowledge me or and i'm i'm pretty well known that way like i can sense the undercurrent because there are a lot of big accounts that follow me on twitter and uh, i've interacted with I've been, the people i'm accusing also they've threatened me of a legal suit before not directly but uh, if you see my piece uh, that i wrote recently i accused the public health foundation of india and its president shina threddy for being involved in all kinds of crimes i actually covered this issue in my channel last year and that interview i did with the journalist actually has the most amount of views any of my videos i've ever got and we just named these people and exposed all their connections and they are some of the most powerful people who hold a lot of influence in india so i indirectly got threatened with a legal notice saying that okay you hosted this interview and all so if you don't take it down then we're going to start a legal suit against you but nothing yet man like it's, it's just i've just been waiting and it's just been ignorance i i don't i don't think they're going to be able to do it for much long because this issue is gaining much more momentum now and a lot of people are starting to come on board but yeah that's the short uh, summary of our legal battles now what has happened with this article that i wrote is that our lawyers have actually sent a legal notice to the health minister asking for the removal of all these people in the task force who have these conflicts of interest and asking them to scrap all their policy recommendations because there are very clear uh, you know case laws in india wherein our courts have struck down recommendations that have come from people who are advising on policy when they have a conflict of interest so according to the law also they have to scrap all these uh, unscientific policies and they should appoint a unbiased committee that doesn't have these kind of conflicts and then let them make uh, you know policy and we have don't have a shortage of good scientists and researchers in our country there are many brilliant scientists and researchers working at big positions in all of these different government departments who i am connected with myself who are involved in this fight and pushing back and who are coming and speaking out now the more extreme this tyranny is getting so yeah that's the next step we're taking and if these people don't respond in 30 days or so that's the kind of time you have to give them then we're going to file a case in the supreme court against them and we have a great lawyers with us like these lawyers i'm working with now they have a very good rapport they know a lot of judges personally in these courts in fact it's through them that we've been able to get this message out to a lot of people in the legal community and the judiciary because they have good connections with people in the police people in uh, intelligence bureau people in uh, the legal system they know judges personally they know politicians as well so they have been a big breakthrough for us because it's it's through them that a lot of these issue are at least getting to the ears and they're being they having to be confronted that there are people who are aware about this stuff and who who will challenge you head on no matter like how powerful you think you are so, yeah and that's what we plan to do next and i'm planning to start a twitter campaign as i said and a media campaign uh, to expose these people and like directly call them out because as i said a lot of these people names haven't been known till now so i want to make the indians aware uh, of course i've made them pretty aware through my piece but people don't typically sit to ten- read long articles so i'm going to be making a lot of infographic driven material a lot of short videos right. like exposing these people and just uh, calling them out yeah that's the next step very interesting are you facing censorship you know with all this great work you're doing it a lot of like a lot of it man yeah i've it. been facing it since the last huh. uh, two years i actually used to run an instagram page called awakened indians with my friend and uh, one of my videos over there had i think 500000 views like it got super viral i, had, I basically I'll tell you, i was outside my the chief uh, minister of uh, maharashtra udhav thakre okay he's this very uh, powerful politician so we went outside this is the bungalow to do a protest out here and i have this like 3 4 minute short clip where i'm basically just like going on a rant about masks and vaccines and testing and this was like and i think before the second wave started like in february or march and the video went super viral like i think uh, people messaged me from like us and like indians in us and like, oman and all the other countries when a video reached all the way till there it went super viral on whatsapp I remember sitting in uh, cabs with taxi drivers and they saw my face and they were like dude like this is your video right so that's that's how much that message spread and uh, on insta also it went super viral but then uh, my page got taken down so i actually lost that video totally because i put up another video where a couple of villagers were talking about the issues that certain uh, cell phone towers went up in their locality and immediately after that like 20 30 people expired and a couple of days and then they managed to get the t- tower out and then the people stopped dying so i had put that video up and then because of that they just took they took the whole bloody page down man like without a warning without anything like just talking about a radiation dangers and issues which is a very legitimate uh, you know concern like a lot of people have muddied up the waters by linking 5g to coronavirus and saying that 5g causes covid but that's actually the fire that we've given to the enemy to actually censor us so there's a very nuanced conversation around this wherein 
the truth is that electromagnetic fields whether that be 4g radiation or, or emfs in general have biological effects like this has been studied in the scientific literature for a very long time and low frequency emf radiation has biological effects that affect the heart that affect the reproductive system that affect the neural system this is very well documented okay and the science behind this advanced quite a bit so i should to talk about these issues and to say that they have health issues they rolled out this, this whole 5g co coronavirus thing that 5g doesn't cause coronavirus and anyone who's going to say that is going to be deplatformed so anyone who even talks about 4g dangers or emf issues on health or not even respect to covid but just anything else they just get taken down like in the video i uploaded we weren't saying that 5g caused coronavirus or something we were just saying look these towers came up and these people died within a few days and he took the towers down and the issue got solved i like, can't you see it's a, it's a clear cause and effect man. and they removed our page over that so we have faced a lot of censorship especially shadow banning on facebook man like i remember uh, we hosted a conference last year like a physical conference where i spoke on a stage and we had other speakers speaking as well and we had a good audience and we live streamed that through different platforms so i remember like facebook uh, the engagement was so organic like i, I would I, that video had 20000 views and some thousand shares and like more than i think 1500 shares or something and now i post a video like that and it's, i get it shows me 234 shares like the last video i did with uh, with this lawyer 234 shares and 250 views like how how is that possible do it like is this not physically possible and like if if someone shared that video 250 times it's supposed to have so like more views than the number of shares <laughs> <laughs> oh uh, and twitter even yeah. i mean i find every time i go to let's say tone vase's page or somebody's page like the tweet his pin tweet i like it every day and it just gets unliked i like it again it unliked so yeah, that happens yeah, on so many pages so the art truth is in short supply it's anyways, a war man like there's no other way to mince it it's it's an outright war against humanity and the psychopaths are in control of our power structures and uh, silicon valley and all of this and they're just basically using that to throttle all the people who are trying to inform others and uh, you know launch attacks against them to uh, you know condone them or to demoralize them or show them as some kind of quacks and conspiracy theorists who just lost their mind but thankfully even despite all of this as there's a huge growing mo- movement and that's primarily being fueled because of the insane restrictions that people are facing today which is making people realize that maybe there's something going on and maybe these people who question the system and who bring up these issues have something to say and then they're actively going out and looking for us and i've come across many people like that who had dismissed me like when i started my channel as some kind of wacko but then everything that's happened since then it just helps people to come around and if people are honest and don't have an ego then they can just come and express look i was wrong about this i, I had my own preconceptions but just l- listening to you for so long and experiencing this has given me a new perspective so yeah these people exist and it's growing all the time so we shouldn't be discouraged by the censorship like we just have to continue a uh, moving forward coming up with more innovative ways to reach people like even over here if everything gets censored we are going to take to the streets like so many of us in india some activists are taking to the streets organizing meetings in villages and cities and just like taking it to the streets man that's where the real battle is at ultimately and what is the call to action then you want by the way thank you for so much for this like 2 hours of your time this is no stress i mean i, I feel I'd love to speak to you for two hours but yeah, yeah i feel me. well i'm down to do this again anytime this has been spectacular and this is like uh, me coming out also and and acknowledging to the world that look i i know more shit's going down outside of just bitcoin and and i just think about you know 20 needed, years i think man like i i appreciate your your courage and your honesty to to come out with your opinions like a lot of people usually get intimidated to not come out because they'll be picked on in some way but i i'll just tell like anyone watching if you're any person of influence or anyone like mm. who is a ceo of a company or whatever it is don't feel like you will be isolated if, if you speak out okay there's a huge growing community there are people like you i'll tell you personally man like i know like friends of mine are heirs to families like billionaire families in india that are really like prime time names so there are people like that within the system who who have spoken out there are top scientists there are people from the business community from the entertainment industry like i know a lot of people in bollywood reach out to me and tell me about the issues they're facing and who are trying to do something in their own circles so there are people in on all fronts man even in india even 
abroad of course it's much more because the awareness has been there for a very long time but i think india is a little bit late to the scene but even despite that there's a huge growing a chorus of voices that's going to constantly keep growing man because yeah. i think most people on the planet are good people and once they come to know what the truth of this issue is once once they're able to deal with their own psychological biases and their cognitive dissonance and all that mm. and they actually get to confront the truth that's when we'll see a revolution of consciousness in the world as as well as in india yeah. so i would just say that to people who are scared to come out mm. that don't don't be scared because it, this is a like very fundamental thing that's connected to every single liberty and like thing we love that we actually respect in life today because if mm. if this agenda goes on this is a message i want to give to the bitcoin community also mm. that just think we have our bull runs and just sit on our money like, I, i don't have to worry about money like i've been a bitcoiner for a very long time so it's it's not like i'm a billionaire or something but it's not like i have to worry about to think okay where am i going to get my next month income from whatever like it's actually bitcoin that help me fund my room like i'll just give a shout out to bitcoin because hmm. like this this is something that changed my life man like it's i wish i got into it early on because i came across it in like 2015 only but then when it was actually much less like it was, i think it was like i don't know 50 dollars or something back then but then getting into the bitcoin space early and getting into technicals and i started following tone and a lot of other people that actually helped me to fund my own whole room so if you see all the books i have out here wow. like this share this yeah. thing this thing and like, like a, mm-hmm. a whole other room full of books and like some of these books are rare books that have cost me a lot of money to collect and it's like special collector's items and things so like none of this would have been possible without bitcoin like all the gear i use today and like to have even like to have the ability to step out of my traditional career and to come and work towards this thing is a lot of people financially support me now after i've done the work and after i've shown people that this is something mm. worth fighting for and if you can't directly contribute at least help us out financially so we can get things going because it like money does help right that's why i am a big capitalist at heart and not the way people perceive capitalism in leftist circles someone who believes in the power of money and uh, the power of uh, private property and capital and for good people to be able to use that power to actually do you know to change things in a good direction in the world and that's something that bitcoin helped me do because it's because of bitcoin that like i have got the even the stress free mindset to get out of my traditional career before like i was pursuing finance and i had completed my graduation in accounts and finance and i was planning to pursue my cfa and do an mba in finance and all that and i i, I got to be aware about all this stuff back then in college and i was like dude if this stuff is going to go on then my career is worth jack shit it's just i'm not going to do any of that because this is they're coming for humanity they're coming for our souls they they're coming for the very like basic liberty that we value so if they manage to bring in a technocratic system then like none of this is going to matter my career is not going to matter then because we're all going to be equal slaves under the tyrannical ruling class world government that they want to set up so that's bitcoin actually helped me to move out of that so that this is a message i'm giving to the bitcoin you community. are a lot of people uh, a lot of people think bitcoin is part of this cabal this tyrannical oh, yeah, plan yeah, to take yeah, over the world you ever hear they that conflate, <laughs> they conflate digital currency with the soul and actually like their their concerns are legitimate they're just misplaced because they have half knowledge so there's a real concern behind these technocrats who are actually they're primarily international bankers okay if you study the roots of the ruling class in the world they go back to the international banking families like the rothschilds and the warburgs and the shifts uh, these people actually uh, monopolize and set up all these central banks around the world that uh, have rigged the entire factual reserve fiat currency system including the federal reserve as, as well as the you know, european central bank and all of that and uh, what they want to do is they want to roll out a world digital currency this has been in the plan since a very long time if you study these people and the writings they've been talking about like a cashless world digital currency going back to the 90s okay i can give you books from there that basically like talk about this stuff so a lot of people have apprehension with cryptocurrency because they don't understand uh, the entire cypherpunk movement around it. they've not really researched uh, the properties of bitcoin a lot of people just compare all these every single altcoin to bitcoin and they think it's all the same so actually i'll tell you from my own personal experience i don't blame people but i had to actually spend Uh, six to eight months really going down with the bitcoin rabbit hole as well as there's a time when i used to hold like uh, 20 different altcoins in coin market cap when i was a little na- naive to the how things work earlier but the more i understood it the more i tend to lean towards bitcoin and i'm not a pure maximalist like i do think there are other cryptos can have applications and stuff 
but as as long as it comes to fighting this battle like actually having a deflationary store of value the most secure unit of account around the world the censorship resistant properties that bitcoin gives you the ability to just disappear from somewhere with a million dollars in your head like all this stuff in, a, in, a, in the most secure way right like no other cryptocurrency can do that for you so that was like how i got into it and this is why i would tell all the bitcoiners who are still watching this mm. if they are that like it's not all about money man it's you want to amass that wealth but your wealth is worth nothing if you don't live in a society that doesn't value your property rights and your right to self ownership because the kind of system these people are wanting to create i'm telling you they're going to demonize bitcoin mining uh, they course. they've already started fear mongering with co2 propaganda and they're saying that this uh, carbon dioxide is destroying the planet so this, you see the same pitch like why they are more favorable towards old coins and not against proof of work and like mining because they're wrapping it in this whole uh, a marketing scheme that bitcoin is a threat to the environment and mm-hmm. this is going to like be devastating to the planet so they're going to attack bitcoin with all these most of the shit coins are fine because they use proof of stake or whatever and that doesn't really get into the way because they're not really decentralized like if bitcoin gives us the most amount of decentralization because we can run a node because like we can do all these things with which we can exercise a power over the protocol like we can make sure that this is our node and we are verifying all the rules and like you know all the other powers amazing powers that bitcoin gives the individual node runner is what i think makes bitcoin so valuable in terms of decentralization as well so i would say that even if you get all the wealth in bitcoin like even if you're a bitcoin millionaire or something tomorrow if you can't spend your money anywhere if they create this technocratic social credit system that they want to if they link if they give you mandatorily give you a digital id which they want to and they're working towards and they link like all these different services in your life with their id so you can't like what they want to do is basically bring in a central bank digital currency they want to ban all decentralized cryptos that threaten the monopoly on the financial system and then they basically want to program that central bank digital currency with the vaccine certificates and the social credit so if you engage in wrong thing if you practice the wrong behaviors then you get cut off from certain parts of society your account your bank account might be blocked uh, they want to create this uh, totally cashless digital currency that means there's no bearer asset called cash so like everything in their control if you listen to andres antonopoulos he describes that very well even when he's done interviews with joe rogan that these technocrats are basically building a system where they want to remove all alternatives like gold and uh, decentralized cryptocurrency they want to centralize cashless system which is tied into social credit and the vaccine certificates so if you don't get vaccinated every single year or every single 6 months or whatever then your money is worthless they want to crash the banking system by creating hyperinflation so there's a lot of stuff that they want to do on the monetary front as well and the most important thing to realize is if even if you're a bitcoin millionaire if you can't spend it in the world if your right to travel is blocked if your right to start a business is blocked because you're the wrong kind of person or you have the wrong kind of ideas your wealth is worth jack shit like unless you are living in an off grid community where people respect your you know cryptocurrency or whatever but other than that like if you don't actually realize your responsibility towards society and actually like preserving the right to be able to spend your crypto okay if it's banned it's going to be increasingly difficult to spend it if they come out and they have tech which which, which makes it easier for them to censor to be able to block cryptocurrency transactions you know all all of these are big threats to our liberty so it's, it's no good if you save your money and become bitcoin billionaire but you can't spend it so it's very important for our community to understand the the interconnection between the financial side of things and of the political landscape that's currently taking place because if we just focus on one and i'm not knocking the kind of importance of getting rich i think getting rich is a very important thing that can actually do a lot of good if the right people in the world get rich who have the right ideas who have the right moral compass so we need to pursue that but we also need to make sure that we guard our civil liberties and we guard our rights because if those goes away the, uh, go away then our money is of no use yeah Cool man, I think that's a great uh, point to bring this one to a close. But I call this Bitcoin stories. So I was a bit surprised to see how much we actually spoke about Bitcoin today. So I'm, I'm happy to hear that had a huge influence on your thinking and your ability to just free yourself from all of this. Because I'm not gonna lie, I'm I am really worried, and I feel like if people like me who have been questioning the system for ten years are this late to realizing some of what. this medical tyranny as you referred to it as is happening then oh, how, how can we expect others 
this is my, I guess, our attempt by trying to break it down as much as we can. But, but I think that to, the issue, you know, uh, Sunny, the issue existed because there have been uh, people who've been very afraid to speak out. And even if uh, there's been just this big lack of understanding, like we have a lack of content creators, we have a lack of people who have the courage to come and uh, come out up front about this and actually convey the ideas to the public. Because as I said, don't get mad- magically preserved because you scribble something in the constitution like that piece of paper is not going to protect anyone's rights rights get preserved when people are aware about what their rights are like it's only when you understand them can you even defend something you, you can't defend your rights if like you believe that you don't have the right to do it in the first place right and then you would think it's acceptable if you think the government has the right to shut you down or to force a mask on your face or to force an injection up your arm if you believe that's not your right to, to actually exercise that then you're not even going to rebel in the first place so i think it's important people wake up to the rights and then actually create the kind of cultural environment in which they can be preserved because the culture is super important. The knowledge, the spread of ideas, uh, you know, changing people's hearts and minds so that they can align their uh, behaviors in line with what their uh, newly formed perceptions are. That's ultimately what helps to preserve liberty. Like it can only be preserved when people actually stand up and, you know, fight for them. That, that's the only way we can do this here. So we need a lot more information and education going forward. And I think this is going to explode, man. I don't think that this is going to end in a place where these people win. I think that I'm very optimistic for humanity overall, despite just given all the roadblocks. Because I've been doing this for the last six years, man. So I've been in a place where no one wanted to listen. And I was a crazy guy. who. Uh-oh. Hey, Johan, I think I lost you there. Are you there? Hey, Sunny. Sorry, I just yeah, yeah. called me. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was that last sentence there? Yeah, I was saying that if we don't uh, value our rights, really, if we don't stand up for them, then no one's, they, we're not going to preserve them. But I, I think I was saying something else, but I lost my chance. I would love to, again, let's do another one when you're free and in, in the future. I would love to do a deep dive into rights because I had a lot of questions in my head when you're talking about that. And I agree, that is a central point. I think you said at one point you alluded that the rights come to us from the constitution, but I, maybe they don't. I, do, because, I don't think that. I don't think. Yeah, that. yeah, it comes I, to I, us from God, I think that, or that, does it come? I, where yeah, does it come from us? Because that's what this they say what in the U.S., saying, right? Uh, <laughs> this is what I was saying in the end that the our rights can't be just preserved by uh, someone writing down in a constitution or something. It's something that people need to be aware about and then like work towards them. And I was also alluding to the fact that we need many more content creators, and mm. also how. I think that I'm very optimistic going into the future because I've been at a place where no one wanted to listen to what I was saying. And now I have a huge audience and a big network across the country and a lot of people uh, willing to put their time, their energy, their money, their resources into Mm. fighting along with our group and everything we're doing. So I, I do see that going from a place of zero to coming this far is, it gives me a perspective. Like a lot of people getting into this now might think that it's too late but trust me we're just getting started like the, the more intense it gets and the, the more the severe the threat on our rights gets the more uh, people are going to come on our side eventually and we will be able to turn this around yeah nice okay i love leaving this on a positive note uh, johan thanks man for everything you're doing i hope like i said bitcoiners people around the world when they listen to this they support you and your cause and and you didn't mention the name of your entity or did you like the, the yeah, group so that you created. I, I run the channel. I run a YouTube channel called Anarchy for Freedom India. There you that's go. my own post. And that's where I dedicate most of my time to. I also work, I'm a core member. Like I was one of the founding core members of a group called Awaken India Movement. So that's a larger banner under which the non-radicals, the people who do who get put off by Anarchy, they, they can you know come and work with us out there because it's smart, it wouldn't yeah. be easy for me to scale this up if it was anarchy for freedom so we and of course anarchy, that's my project so then it would become all about me but in order to scale this up we needed something that was more represented that was fighting for the overall issue and not really taking a stand on say anarchy or political issues and stuff so that's why we created awaken india movement which is it's a larger message of just uh, standing against all the scientific fraud behind the pandemic as well as standing against censorship and just uh, moving closer towards uh, valuing people's uh, natural rights. That's what Awaken India Movement stands for. So you can go and check us out on our website also, awakenindiamovement.com. I'm very fundamentally involved in there as well. 
I'm also involved in a medical company called Thrive. We practice functional medicine and we basically want to reduce the power of big pharma. So we're using our expertise and our knowledge in terms of diagnostics and then reversing people's chronic diseases naturally through, uh, you know, fasting, through uh, like sauna use, through uh, supplementation, nutraceuticals, cool. various, uh, you know, things mm. that, that we naturally reverse people's health issues after diagnosing the root cause of that. Yeah, I'm involved in all these fronts mainly in my through my channel. Also, I touch on a lot of different subjects. So, I touch on some far out subjects also. But uh, mainly right now, I'm involved in the fighting against the entire pandemic and the fraud that's gone on behind that. And yeah, just ending on a note. Speaking to rights, I this is the this is the main thing I like to convey to the public that rights don't come from the constitution or from legislators. Hmm. Uh, the non-aggression principle is at the foundation of our liberties and that is something that whatever you want to call it whether you want to call it as a natural law okay i would allude to it as something that exists in nature because not following it has consequences like we we know that gravity is a law because it has certain consequences like you know since gravity is a law that things fall to the ground so because uh natural law this entire body of knowledge that exists for behavioral decisions that people make okay it's there are laws in the universe that govern the consequences of the like depending on how moral a society is okay and the morality comes down to understanding uh, the fundamental principle of the non-aggression principle this is a principle that goes back thousands of years you can trace it back uh, to the sufis of islam and to like various other ancient cultures like they all understood this okay and they when you spoke to me about has this been tried anywhere like there have been ancient societies uh, that have understood this principle and have tried to work on them so probably we can speak about that in another podcast because there's a lot of ground that uh, we covered out here but yeah in an article rights don't come from government uh, rights are a moral concept okay a right is basically the understanding that it's wrong for someone else to initiate physical force against you or your property like that's sorry that's not their right and the rights are defined in the negative okay so if we can define what a right isn't everything other than that automatically becomes a right because the rights are at the basically they get derived from the non-aggression principle this is why rights are only violated when we initiate physical force against someone on the property that's the only time we violate someone else's rights like everything other than that all these victimless crime laws where there's no direct victim involved, but things are done in the name of culture and the greater good. All of that is trash and that absolutely should go because whenever these laws are passed where there's victimless crimes, the government is a criminal. That's that's the important thing that people need to understand. Yeah, that's this is why constitutions can't preserve rights because rights don't come from government. They're not grants or privilege. Okay. They are things that you're inherently born with. As mm. as a consequence of you incarnating into your physical body, you get the right to self ownership. Okay, because you alone Who are declared able to that. Accept. Like, why are you <laughs> right about that? Bill Gates, you get to declare what goes into your body. You can yeah. you can look into the argumentation ethics. That's something that Hans Hermann Hoppe came up with. So hmm. a lot of libertarians use different uh, ways of uh, deriving this non-aggression principle. So if you look at uh, Rothbard's argument, it's more of human beings on this planet their natural tendency is to uh, transform the environment and to actually develop things to the best uh, you know place possible and if you if people acknowledge that as the natural tendency of a human being or there's something the human being should strive for on this planet then that's best served by valuing the natural rights so that's the kind of uh, place that Rothbard comes with uh, hands on uh, kind of argument to how we derive self-ownership and property rights might appeal to logical and rational people more because it's not based on invoking any kind of God or any natural forces, but it's more based on a very logical line of reasoning, which I, which I can't really explain now because he's done like one, two hours with videos on this. But mm-hmm. if, if someone wants to understand how we can logically derive the non-aggression principle and the right to self-ownership and property rights, then they can go and watch Hans Hermann Hoppe's uh, videos on argumentation ethics. It's called argumentation ethics. But yeah, primarily we can, we know, as I said, we know these rights exist because uh, violating them has consequences. Okay, I would I would call it the law of freedom. So the more society aligns its behavior to understanding the non-aggression principle and the self-defense principle and values people's individual rights, 
that's when we have the most freedom and freedom is also not a vague word okay freedom is the ability for a people to engage in any action that's not causing harm to another person mm. okay that's my definition of freedom that is the definition of freedom okay so if you want to maximize freedom there's only one way you can maximize freedom that is when you make people understand that every single person's individual rights and property rights are absolute because if people don't understand that then there are going to be all kinds of encroachments on people's individual rights and bodily uh, you know property rights in the name of these emergencies and the collective good and what not so if you want to maximize freedom in society the morality of a society and people's uh, understanding of these natural rights that i spoke about and valuing them and actually exercising them like you know this has practical implications also if people understood and valued the right to self ownership and property a government wouldn't exist and that's how we would have maximum freedom because if people understood that this is my money no one can come and steal it from me whether that's an individual person whether that's a group of people whether that's a group of people who voted and delegated uh, some their right to someone else and magically pretended that we can give more rights than we have but no one can come and take these from you so that's why taxation can't even exist and if taxation can't exist then the government can't exist and that's how we have maximum freedom so uh, a lot of people also get confused because they think that freedom and rights are a kind of thing that exist okay so if they think that murders and uh, rapes happen that then that society doesn't have freedom that's not true like you know rights morality are uh, moral concepts and uh, if they have to be preserved in the world people need to understand them and then stand up to defend uh, themselves against invasions of these rights it's not like if you create an anarchy society the murderers and the rapists and the criminals will go away it's just that the biggest criminal that we have today called government which gets seen as moral by most people and which is responsible for the most amount of crime because psychopaths land up hijacking the institution of government and then using the belief in authority to actually pass these laws which these order followers get brainwashed into following as some virtue that's how most of the evil and genocide has taken place on the planet has taken place if you go and ask a person today a random person who is the biggest threat to you who do you may face the most threat by a, a, no, a normal people or government or irs agents they would like a sane person who understood who didn't have these uh, mind warps into believing that government is necessary or something if they actually uh, acknowledge that taxation is theft then the irs or the tax department is the you know biggest harasser or any kind of government agent is the biggest harasser more than any private criminal like i've been personally as a libertarian i've been harassed and uh, my rights have been taken away and i've been stolen from and subjugated more by government agents and law enforcers than any other private criminal that exists so if i'm going to move towards an anarchist society i'm going to remove most of the people that are restricting my rights and then i'm going to be left with few people that are always going to exist okay so it's not like if we magically get rid of government all the problems of society will disappear it's just that you'll be able to deal with these people much more easily and we'll see them as criminals we won't have these vague notions that oh they have the right to do this because of the consent of the government and because of the political process and because of democracy and all that you can just call them out like they are and that's we'd be able to deal with them much more easily that yeah that's what i'd like to end this well dude you are so articulate man so many of these things you're talking about are things that i i wrestle with and i probably believe to a large extent from before even bitcoin but just never i never really uh, met someone who's who's courageous enough to talk about it and then actually articulate it okay i'm i promise okay this is done so let, let's bring this one to an end and like i said if if you're down we'll do another one whenever next week yeah, uh, this yeah, week, I love uh, this has been amazing okay you know i'm going to i'm going to kill this recording just stick around for 2 seconds